and evening probably to some of you. Welcome to our launch event for the proposed Environmental Health Language Collaborative. And the purpose of today's webinar is to highlight the value of creating language and community in catalyzing knowledge-driven discovery in environmental health research. Next. So I will run through some logistics here. Uh, most of you are very familiar with Zoom meeting already, but uh, please remain muted unless you're a presenter speaking or unless uh, you're participating in the discussion later today. If you have any questions, please add them to the Zoom chat feature and then we will call on you. If you prefer to call in by phone, if you're having some kind of technical challenge with the video, then you can find in the Zoom chat the call-in phone number and passcode. As well, please update your Zoom name to include both first name and last name. That not only allows us to ensure that we have accurate attendance, but it also helps to create that collegial community atmosphere that everybody can, can see who else is participating in this effort. If you're having any technical difficulties, please uh, send a message into the Zoom chat feature. And then if you aren't able to use the chat feature, you can also email the ntp-meetings at icf.com. And then finally, the meeting will be recorded. And once it is converted into 508 compliant form, it's going to be added to the workshop event page as well as a link to the recording disseminated through our collaborative listserv. Okay, next. I just want to set the stage for how today's event will fit in with several other upcoming virtual events. So our primary event is the two-day workshop to be held in September. More details about that later. In order to spend less time on the presentations at the workshop and really focus on having some uh, intense discussions about the collaborative. We've decided to host two pre-workshop events to sort of help set the stage and do some of that upfront presentations. So therefore, today's event is intended to provide attendees with the context for why we are embarking on this community-driven harmonized language initiative and to lay the foundation for how the community can come together. The goal of the July workshop is to actually offer an introductory session for those not familiar with knowledge organization systems. By that, we mean vocabularies, terminologies, and especially ontologies, helping people learn how when to use them, where to find them, and how best to apply them. Next. So shortly, I will be turning it over to Dr. Wojcik, who will set the big picture stage for why NIEHS is fostering this initiative. Dr. Charles Smith will then focus more on the specific need for an environmental health language community. We will then hear from four speakers who will share specific examples of how applying language standards have advanced discovery in their areas of research. That will be followed by a 10 minute break and then when we reconvene, we will hear from three community representatives who will share the accomplishments and lessons learned from their community standards efforts. The last session will focus in specifically on describing the draft vision, mission, activities, goals, and organizational model for the proposed Environmental Health Language Collaborative. And it's going to provide an opportunity for you as attendees to begin providing input and helping to shape its development. So with that, I would now like to introduce Dr. Wojcik, Director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and Director of the National Toxicology Program. Great, Stephanie, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, terrific. Well, as Director of NIHS and the NTP, I wanna take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this inaugural webinar for Environmental Health Language the Collaborative. I was uh, chatting with Stephanie prior to uh, bringing you all on. Uh, we've you know, been talking to Stephanie about these concepts for uh, almost the entire time of over a of decade that I've been at NIEHS. So I'm just delighted that we're having this webinar and that um, she and together with Charles and others are taking the leadership to make these things happen. So can I have the next slide, please? 
So what I thought I'd do to just set the stage for the workshop is uh, just you know, describe a little bit of the enormity of the, the data challenges that we have in, in, in evaluating environmental exposures. So as you can see on the side, studying the environment is complicated uh, because NIEHS defines environment broadly and, in, and includes a whole variety of different exposures from chemicals and the products and the building materials that we, we use, uh, pollutants in the air, pesticides and agricultural chemicals, uh, cosmetics and sunscreens. So we analyze the chemicals in our workspaces as well as the influence of lifestyle factors such as nutrition, exercise, smoking, vaping, and psychosocial stress. I mean, the bottom line is that we're interested in evaluating a whole variety of different exposures. And this is, this is complicated and it creates really complicated data sets. Next slide, or uh, click, yeah. So the, to make our task even more difficult, uh, we have to account for differences in the way that each of us respond to a given environmental exposure. So different individuals, as you can see here in the center, uh, we not only look different, but they have, we have different genetic and biological makeups and we respond to the environment in different ways. So what might be dangerous to one person uh, or helpful to that individual uh, at a given dose may not apply to someone else. So next, uh, click again. <clears throat> So what's emerging from you know, many members of our community is the, is the concept of precision environmental health, while we, where we study the gene by environment effects. So this involves better understanding the genetic, the epigenetic, and various biological factors that contribute to individual variability to ultimately help us to understand why individuals uh, have differential responses to various environmental exposures. So the next slide, please. So, and to complicate the, uh, the, the picture even further, uh, there's an increasing awareness that studying in the environment, it really needs to extend beyond analyzing one exposure at a time. So I noticed that Gary, um, Gary Miller has logged on. So Gary, how you doing? And he's a big uh, advocate of this new framework that, uh, that we've been uh, advancing uh, in the environmental health sciences called, called the Exposome. So it's really about uh, better understanding the, the, the uh, taking a holistic approach to understanding the totality of exposures. <clears throat> so it's really an experimental design to, uh, to test all different environmental exposures over an individual's lifetime. It's a, an approach that's an untargeted and hypothesis-free assessment of all environmental exposures. And uh, efforts are currently underway to better define the exposome and operationalize it and to develop the tools and the experimental approaches to study the physical, the chemical, the dietary, the psychosocial, and the many other factors that contribute to the totality of environmental exposures in individuals over their lifespan. So next slide, please. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of details in my brief introductory remarks here, but one tangible step that NIHS took several years ago to implement on the exposome was to develop the what we call the Human Health Exposure Analysis Resource, or we call it HERE. So the focus of HERE is to add or expand exposure analysis of biological and environmental samples for investigators and programs that are currently not equipped to conduct the analysis. So HERE also provides public access. Uh, it's it, to create a, data, data a publicly accessible data repository for the information that is collected. So the re resource offers traditional biomonitoring for targeted hypothesis-driven research involving the analysis of specific contaminants, uh, analysis of markers of exposure and other substances that are known or suspected of, of affecting health. So additionally, the HERE resource provides hypothesis-free exploratory analysis, utilizing some of the, the most advanced technologies to discover new association between chemicals or metabolizes, uh, meta metabolites and, and correlating that with health. Next slide, please. So as you can imagine, we are collecting a lot of data and we have huge challenges around managing this wide variety of exposure, genetics, epigenetics, and other biological data sets. And to do this in a way that we can ultimately achieve our goals of better understanding the impact of the totality of exposure over the lifetime of an individual. So 
this, of course, will take a lot of organizing and a lot of integrating of these data sets uh, and to do this globally in a way that we can all take advantage and share our data so that yeah, ultimately we can find, we can compare, and we can integrate the data in a way that we can develop and apply innovative new artificial intelligence and machine learning tools to create knowledge to make new discoveries happen. But developing this organized data repository depends on a critical component, and that's what today's webinar is all about, which is the use of common language. So what's, what Stephanie and Charles have provided me here is a slide that we're, we're both looking at. And this is a, it's, it's the really the power of common language is illustrated um, in this slide by the National COVID Cohort Collaborative or the NC3. So in less than a year, the NC3 was able to bring together a platform of over eight, 580 million observations and more than 2 million COVID cases from a large number of clinical systems. So using CDEs uh, enabled the integration of 200 plus active projects focused on COVID. And integration of this data is allowing the biomedical community to now gain insights into COVID-19 that simply wouldn't have been possible without the, the thoughtful and careful integration of data using these common data elements and, and common language. So next slide, please. So as a next step in the direction, a step in the direction of, of fundamentally doing the same thing with the environmental health sciences, uh, Charles Schmidt and Stephanie, uh, Stephanie Holmgren and uh, many of their colleagues at NIEHS and across the environmental health sciences community have really taken the initiative to organize this workshop and to be engaging in the discussions uh, that need to happen to develop this uh, common language and common data elements and other things that are associated with the environmental health uh, language collaboratives. So over the course of this workshop, uh, we hope to achieve several things. I mean, the first is to set the context for why harmonized language approaches are needed to advance environmental health research. So hopefully at the end of this workshop, you'll be convinced this is absolutely the thing that we need to be doing. We also hope to demonstrate the value that can be achieved if the environmental health sciences community comes together to use harmonized language approaches. We also hope to explain the goals and the workings of this proposed community effort and to encourage your participation in this, in this collaborative effort. And in the end, it's really to solicit your advice and your input to ensure that this effort is successful. So without further ado, so thanks for the opportunity for allowing me to make some uh, introductory comments. We got a big task ahead of us and I know that we're all up, up for the task and I will turn the virtual podium back over to Stephanie who will take us through next steps. Stephanie. Thank you very much, Dr. Wojcik. And we really do appreciate your support of this initiative. So now I would like to introduce Dr. Charles Schmidt, who is director of the NIEHS's Office of Data Science. Stephanie, can you hear me? Yes, you might need to speak up okay. a little bit. Okay, great. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to try to quickly cover the need for putting together environmental health language community. Um, next slide. So first, I, I think it's fair to say without um, providing evidence that we lack a common language within the environmental health field for describing our studies, our data that we generate, and for the findings that we generate. Um, Further, we lack the ability to harmonize across the various languages that we do use. Um, and, and this will be expanded upon um, in this talk and further talks, but, but that lack of a common language hinders a multitude of things. It hinders our data managers as we collect and represent data. It hinders our researchers who are trying to describe and compare findings, as well as integrate data for analysis. It hinders our modeling community who are trying to develop training data um, to build new generations and models. Our knowledge graph developers who are trying to link data together and build complex systems for mining knowledge. It hinders our tool developers of making applications. 
and it hinders attempts to increase automation and information extraction techniques that are important to be able to bring together um, and pull together and extract information about environmental health. Next slide. And of course, one of the big challenges here, as Rick alluded to, so I won't go into it much, is that the environmental health field is very diverse. <clears throat> and in each of these different silos or, or areas of subfields, we have different languages and, and different maturity of language in terms of being developed and adopted, um, each for different reasons. Um, but we also have the challenge of, of language across these different subfields. Next slide. In addition, we have a variety of actors in the environmental health field. We have epidemiologists or science researchers, risk assessors, the general public. Each of those actors or communities have their own languages and, and means of conveying information. And so we have diversity in both the, the people, the groups involved with environmental health and the subdomains. Next slide. So in thinking about how we get towards a common or at least a harmonized set of languages for environmental health, we feel it's very important that we start looking at use cases, um, use cases that are important to the field and use cases where we can potentially make advancements in a language, both in terms of creating it and applying it for success. Um, in looking at use cases, as mentioned, we have to look at both the questions that someone may be considering, as well as the people who are asking those questions. Next slide. So this summer, well, really over the last year, we've been working with a number of people to develop an initial set of use cases. So these are, are really to start try to get the ball rolling to try to put into practice a community around cases that, that um, groups that we've spoken to initially felt were important. And so we've, we've put together five initial use cases and use case champions who are working this month and next work to, to try to define these use cases, try to understand the gaps and the opportunities. Um, this will continue at the workshop this fall. We, we are definitely interested in more use cases but really in trying to advance at least an initial step and kind of get the gears turning as a community. Uh, the link below has these use cases if you'd like to explore that further. Next slide. And of course, those use cases we just showed are fairly high level. Um, we've broken those down into sub use cases and even those may have to be broken down further to really make progress on this. But, but you know, Starting down this road, we think is important and getting these defined so that people do have a sense of where are the gaps and the opportunities is important. Next slide. And I just wanted to highlight um, what I think is initial success. We've had our first couple of use case meetings and our first one, which um, Michelle English from EPA did a great job of leading. We looked at what data exists for given chemical exposure scenario and what we found in, in talking about it as a as a group was that we had common perspectives on how to do this kind of search we had a measurement perspective and a bioprocess perspective that we each have kind of independently come to we had very similar or translatable data models as well as very similar and translatable terminologies and ontologies that we were we were using we weren't completely compatible but but there's a pathway we think to get there and so that opens up a number of opportunities for interoperable data models federated search data extraction um, advanced searches into knowledge graphs we also were able to identify between our groups some of the gaps that we we think we have to face so terminologies for complex endpoints bridging from assays and endpoints to bioprocesses so so we have a start and we have recognition of commonalities and directions to go. So I think that's that's an extremely encouraging first step as we look at how to use a community to move forward environmental health language. Next. Um, and one more. Okay. Um, do you want to recognize that 
there are a number of resources in this area, a number of individuals, groups, and communities who are already working on building ontologies and terminologies and common data elements. And really one of the reasons why we think environmental health language community or collaborative is important is to bring these groups who are doing this work together with that diversity of environmental health actors and subfields so that we can really look at how to expand these efforts or, or adapt these efforts for environmental health. Next. And of course, as a community, I think there's a number of challenges that we face. Um, that together as a community, I think we can really start making progress on. Um, when we look at these ontologies, which ones should we use for different applications? How do we extend these ontologies for environmental health science needs? How do we map data elements from the environmental health field onto these ontologies? Um, a task that we're working on internally with um, some of the people on this call today that is a, a very challenging task. Um, Existing ontologies often don't contain all the needed classes for every type of exposure, so which ones do we focus on? We lack minimal reporting standards for exposure science and toxicology and sparse metadata, so where do we focus there? And, you know, this is one that bothers me on a daily basis. We lack agreement among chemical naming authorities. So how do we judge which authority to use and quality of mappings in, in both chemical space and other spaces? Next. And the social challenges. How do we build consensus across the environmental health sciences community? It's a, it's a vast community um, that spans very different groups of people. And building consensus, consensus or at least harmonization across the community is important. How do we get community adoption? How do we find and collaborate with others with similar needs? And how do we sustain the momentum? This last question, I think, is, is one of the drivers that really pushed us towards trying to start this effort, is that we've seen efforts in the past that, that show promise, but sustaining those efforts has seemed to have been a problem. So we really want to try to push on sustaining an effort, um, a community-based effort here. And next. So ultimately, we think if we can be successful in this, if we can really pull together a community that, that can focus on advancing environmental health language, it's going to improve health. We're going to move the field towards community and endorse best practices, help break down silos and interconnect data resources and data ecosystems, which is especially important as NIH is investing lots of money into building data ecosystems. Um, we can better leverage existing ontologies as well as advance new semantic approaches where needed. This is especially important as building ontologies and terminologies and mappings is a very human time consuming process and we need better methods. Um, promoting fair data management and sharing principles and ultimately catalyzing knowledge group driven discovery by facilitating AI and machine learning approaches. So I'm gonna stop there and turn it back to Stephanie, but I hope I've at least conveyed some of the, the needs that we see and the reasons why we're trying to promote an environmental health language community. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, so for this upcoming presentation session, we have reserved five minutes for questions after each of the presentations. So please submit your questions in the chat box. And I'm now pleased to introduce our next four speakers. Starting us off is Dr. Stephen Edwards, a bioinformatics senior scientist uh, with the RTI International in Research Triangle Park. His current research examines the combined impact of genetic and environmental factors on disease manifestation to better support both precision medicine and public health protection. Dr. Celia Chen, is a research professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Dartmouth College and the current director of the Dartmouth Toxic Metals Superfund program. Her research focuses on the fate and effects of metal contaminants in freshwater and estuarine ecosystems, particularly the bioaccumulation and trophic transfer of mercury in aquatic food webs. Dr. Justin Reese is a computer research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. 
He is an expert in computational biology, bioinformatics, machine learning, and data science. And he has an interest in integrating bioinformatics data to facilitate discovery, especially with respect to human disease. Dr. Jeanette Stengone is an environmental epidemiologist at Columbia University Medical Center with a focus on pregnancy as a vulnerable exposure model or exposure period, sorry. Her current research combines data science techniques with more traditional epidemiologic methods to investigate health effects associated with complex environmental mixtures and multiple exposures. This includes advancing the reuse of existing data through novel data linkages and harmonization and promoting data sharing and interoperability using ontologies and semantic science. So turning the virtual podium over to you, Steve. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm honored to be a part of this kickoff and uh, I'm already convinced of the need for this collaborative and look forward to participating in the coming years. Um, you can go to the next slide. So I'm going to talk for the next 10 minutes about the adverse outcome pathway. And this is a construct that was developed uh, to give a high level understanding of the mechanisms by which uh, environmental uh, stressors uh, can cause toxicity. And it starts with a, the interaction of that stressor with the biological molecule, uh, which is the molecular initiating event or the MIE to the left hand side of the slide. Uh, works uh, through a progression of uh, necessary key events um, that uh, with of increasing higher levels of biological organization and ends with an adverse outcome that can be measured either in an individual or, or in a population. Um, and the important thing is, is this construct not only allows us to, to kind of organize our knowledge and understand these mechanisms, but it also provides a scaffold for the relevant measurements, uh, which are shown towards the bottom of this slide in the, in the tan uh, boxes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the arguments against the AOPs has always been that biology is way too complex to uh, define in a linear pathway, but the people who are developing AOPs couldn't agree more. And the idea behind the AOP is uh, not to reduce the complexity of biology, but to build these uh, individual components that can then be assembled into these biological networks by looking at uh, the uh, shared key events or related key events within these AOPs. And by doing this, you can build a, a network that's as complex as it needs to be and not more so uh, to understand uh, your given problem. Next slide, please. Uh, so not long after the uh, introduction of the AOP concept, uh, there was an international group that came together and uh, decided that uh, if, if the AOPs were really going to, to fulfill their promise, uh, we needed a central storage uh, place for, for that information. And so there was a large international effort, which I was uh, happy to be a part of, uh, that built this uh, AOP knowledge base. Uh, it involves a uh, ever-growing number, both of official tools that are part of the the integrated development effort, as well as uh, an ever-growing number of third-party tools uh, that build upon that effort and provide new capabilities. Next slide, please. And from the beginning of the knowledge base effort, we knew uh, that we needed to uh, consider ontologies and, and leverage existing ontologies wherever possible. And so with that in mind, uh, we actually created uh, in parallel with our object model for our uh, knowledge base uh, and on a core AOP ontology, uh, which really focused only on things that are unique to the AOP. So key events, key event relationships, things of that nature. Uh, and then we relied on existing uh, biological, chemical and other ontologies uh, shown in the non-red colors on this slide. Um, to fill in all of the details. So the, so the core ontology intentionally does not overlap with these others, but it does uh, have uh, specific linkages to these other ontologies. And while our early work focused mostly on the biological perturbations and understanding the AOP uh, itself, uh, we do have 
uh, a, an ever increasing effort recently to um, link in these measurements. Next slide, please. So the ontology, the impacts of uh, these ontologies, both leveraging the existing ones and the and the development efforts, uh, were immediate for the AOPKB. So uh, we can improve our search and browse options uh, with a more standardized vocabulary. Uh, it improved our ability to automatically build these AOP networks by looking for related key events um, that shared semantic similarity. Um, it facilitates development of computational models. I'll touch on that again a little bit later. Um, facilitates the use of AOPs in regulatory applications. Um, and the next example I'll show uh, is really focused on the interoperability and, and the fairness of, of the uh, knowledge base. So if you could do the next slide, please. So this is an a recent example of a third party tool uh, which has um, taken the information from our knowledge base and extended it. So the Wiki Pathways group at Maastricht uh, University um, has pulled out the information and created an RDF uh, endpoint uh, containing this information. They've also extended the, ontol the uh, ontologized information in the knowledge base a bit by tagging genes and proteins that are currently embedded in the free text. Uh, and shown on this slide is a workflow they've uh, developed illustrating how now this information from the AOP knowledge base can be merged with genomics data from the Open TG Gates initiative and with the Wiki Pathways information to now provide an AOP framework for uh, interpreting genomics, toxicogenomics uh, data. So I think this is a great example of, of the type of uh, work, interoperable workflows that can de be derived from this. Next slide, please. A second example was one of the, the driving use cases behind the AOP ontology itself. Uh, so as we were developing this ontology and uh, making sure that it was compatible with the knowledge base, uh, La Bergoon at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, was actually working through a specific decision support tool um, that included both the core ontology with the AOP information as well as um, information about the biological targets themselves and the assays that could be used for those biological targets. And he, he showed a, a theoretical example of how uh, reasoners within these ontologies could actually uh, predict toxicity based on if you had idealized um, information coming from these assays. Uh, more recently, uh, his team has actually assembled a Bayesian framework, again, building from this, um, that then allows for the quantitative information and the imperfections in those assays to give you more probabilistic assessments rather than a, a yes, no answer. Next slide, please. And then the last example I'll talk about is uh, work that we are currently undergoing uh, with the US EPA and talk strategies on trying to build an ontology guided systematic review method for uh, actually building and uh, defining, defining and evaluating AOPs. And so this builds on the, the same ontology that I showed before. Uh, and we focus really on those um, biological ontologies and, and measurement ontologies highlighted in green and gold here um, where that um, we connected to our core AOP ontology. And what we uh, intend to do is uh, utilize the, these as um, a means to define AOP concepts within published abstracts. Next slide, please. And to do that, we needed to uh, expand a, our description of uh, how these different um, boxes interrelate uh, so that a person reading an abstract or eventually hopefully a computer reading an abstract uh, could uh, identify which uh, sections of the abstracts belong in each box and how those boxes would fit together. And so uh, we basically have our either our chemical in the case of an MIE or an upstream key event that perturbs our object, which is now part of a process which then propagates that perturbation into the a disruption of the normal biological processes. 
uh, which then results in an abnormal phenotype, which can now be characterized by our measurement. And again, in each one of these cases, we have existing ontologies uh, that can help describe those parts of the process. Next slide, please. And so we can now take an, a published abstract and we can look for uh, words and phrases within that abstract that fall under those different categories. And next slide, please. And then we can take those uh, words and phrases and assemble them into um, uh, pieces, into groups that correspond to uh, the entities that are already part of our AOP ontology. And so now we're able to relatively, in a relatively straightforward manner, uh, take a published abstract and convert it into something that's a, a bit more computable. Now in talking through this, I've uh, glossed over a lot of details. You'll see that uh, some of these phrases are more complex than we're going to be able to define with a single ontology term. Um, but we are, and we are looking into that. And, and that really, I think, is a, a uh, opportunity more than a challenge. Uh, there are other can other efforts such as the causal activity model work that's taking place within the gene ontology consortium that I think can uh, help inform those efforts. And next slide, please. And uh, I'm a little over time and these are, you've, I've already described all of this. So maybe if you can leave this up for the next minute or two and then switch to the acknowledgements while we round out the question and answer and I can take questions. Thank you very much, Steve. We do have a comment about um, whether it would be preferable to embark on an ontology for exposure science and a parallel effort to the AOP for exposure. Yes, um, I think having a parallel uh, to the to the AOP descriptions on the uh, the toxicology side on the exposure in the exposure realm would be a, a wonderful thing. And as uh, Charles noted in, in his talk, there are, there are actually quite a few examples of uh, where, where this, this effort has started. And I really think that the, the timing is perfect for now trying to, to look at the exposure side of the equation. We do have one last question and that is, Elaine says, hi, Steve, uh, will you be, <laughs> Will you be using the AEP-AOP integrated pathway to ensure the incorporation of exposure concepts, the aggregate exposure pathways? This would seem to be an essential connection to ensure that the connection with exposure is facilitated. Yeah, so I, uh, I am definitely partial to the AEP concept since I was a part of that uh, effort that, um, uh, that started it. Uh, I don't think that's the only uh, option that we have available, but I certainly think it's it's a uh, an existing framework that could help inform these efforts. Okay. Well, great. Well, we will move on now. And next to present is Celia. Thank you again, Steve. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to talk about our Superfund research program, external use case. And for those of you who aren't part of Superfund programs, uh, we were given the opportunity to um, bring together data sets within our areas and aims of Superfund uh, programs and R01s to try to harmonize data and be able to ask more global questions. Our, the title of the one I'm going to talk to you today about is Linking Data from Laboratory and Field Investigations of Mercury Transformation, Bioaccumulation, and Remediation. So this group of happy-looking people in the uh, Zoom meeting, we had many, many Zoom meetings. Uh, we are all mercury scientists. We come from Dartmouth, University of Connecticut, Duke, uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and Smith, the Smithsonian, and we all work on aquatic ecosystems um, to understand mercury fate in the environment. And our overarching goal of this external use case is to was to delineate geochemical, biochemical, and ecological factors controlling methylmercury in aquatic environments. Next slide, please. So before I go any further about the data challenges of doing this, I just want to talk a little bit about the mercury problem. 
um, as I said, we are all Mercury scientists. And so for us, uh, we think about Mercury a lot and this and Mercury is really uh, ranked number three on the USATSDR priority list of contaminants. And it also is a uh, is a toxicant that affects humans and wildlife at very low levels. And for humans, it's really through the consumption of fish that we are exposed to mercury. Um, and so for those of us who study mercury, it's really important to consider the speciation of mercury. So if you see up in the top, up in the sky of this diagram, uh, it's elemental mercury. When it rains down on the watersheds and landscape, it becomes HG2+. And then in uh, water bodies, uh, HG2+, plus, the inorganic, one of the inorganic forms of mercury is transformed into monomethyl mercury. And that's important because monomethyl mercury is the uh, most, more toxic and bioavailable form of mercury that not only is readily bioaccumulated by organisms, but also um, biomagnified in uh, aquatic food webs. And in, in the US, we have 80% of our fish consumption advisories are actually for mercury because of this biomagnification into the fish that we consume. Uh, next slide, please. So um, there are lots of mercury scientists globally. There's a lot going on in the policy world of mercury. Um, and that's because there is something called the Minamata Convention. Uh, and so globally, scientists are trying to pull together big, big data sets uh, of monitoring of uh, mercury in lots of different compartments and many different countries. So there's lots of reasons for harmonizing mercury data sets to achieve broader insights about the mechanisms of methylmercury production, persistence, accumulation across lots of different system types. And we also need data synthesis so that we can better manage mercury pollution at these uh, local and global scales. And then finally, at specific Superfund sites where mercury, there's uh, mercury contamination, we really need to harmonize our data so that we can develop more uh, relevant global models for designing management strategies. So the External use case, which is what we called these, the EUCs, uh, uh, the goals for this one were to identify the best practices for data formatting for mercury research. And we are a group of um, five people who do mercury research. We also wanted to understand the scalability of lab experiment data for mercury with field studies. Uh, and that's usually not done. And so we wanted to see whether the patterns and mechanisms we see in the lab experiments are actually reflected in the re same kinds of uh, mechanisms in the field. And then finally, we wanted to identify the environmental conditions across a, a wide range of sites that control a bio bioaccumulation of mercury and then better understand the remediation potential of uh, the mercury contamination in those sites. So uh, next slide, please. So we had uh, data inputs of a lot of different kinds. As I mentioned earlier, we had field observations and laboratory experiments. Within the field observations, we had more than 12 estuaries and river uh, uh, sites that were in the data sets. Um, but at the beginning of the project, we none of these data were shared or normalized across sites. And so at this point in time, uh, months and months and months later, the data from these five labs have been ingested into a common database, which was no small task, as I'll describe uh, in, in a bit. And they, the um, data sets were normalized as, uh, you know, as a part of an, uh, an ETL process. The variables were um, many, but most of the variables we really uh, had a chance to take a look at through analyzing them were uh, dissolve water concentrate, uh, sorry, surface water concentrations and sediments. We also added all the uh, biotic data that we had for invertebrates and fish, the, the mercury that was bioaccumulated in those um, biotic endpoints. We had also a lot of ancillary data, um, including things like DOC, salinity, temperature, all these other nutrients uh, in the database. We also had sediment analytes. So we have both 
water column and sediment compartments represented in the data set. And in the experiments, there were manipulations that involved um, uh, changes in uh, to manipulate mercury methylation and also the effect of sediment amendments on mercury methylation and um, bioavailability because one of our scientists is a remediation uh, expert. So next slide, please. So this is just a, a, a diagram of the data and how it was brought into a central uh, database and then the, what the database kind of on the right looks like in terms of some of the variables that are in it. We had three uh, really large databases um, because the Dartmouth and Yukon we collaborate on a single um, Superfund uh, project and the Smithsonian UMBC actually were working together and then Duke had the experimental data um, and they were uh, brought in a by JSON, which is a trans, transfer def, transform definition pro, uh, file in JSON format. Um, and this allowed us to reproduce the exact transformation to go from the source file to the file we could then ingest into the database. Um, I should say that this part of the, uh, you know, the process that we went through was very much done by the uh, research um, data scientists at Dartmouth in our research computing department. Uh, they really were the ones that taught us, you know, those of us who are biogeochemists, ecologists, and, uh, and uh, metal chemists, environmental scientists, a whole new vocabulary. Uh, and so um, I'm representing all of us in this uh, presentation today. So I, I just want to acknowledge that as well as uh, say that they really understood um, in a way that we didn't initially the, uh, to the challenges of doing this. Okay, next slide, please. So we just uh, heard a bit about ontologies. And so we started out by uh, attempting to incorporate these in uh, the ontologies, the, the commonly available ones like Envo and Kebi and units to our uh, compilation of data. And, um, and we found that to be extremely difficult. Uh, and, and I understand that, the, you know, these are, it's a good thing to do to use ex existing ontologies. But for those of us scientists who do mercury research, the, the ways that uh, variables were named did not really match our own uh, data. So that turned out to be uh, difficult and not the direction that we went. Uh, we had platforms, including the infrastructure was on Amazon Web Services, the cloud platform. Um, we had uh, the database post GRE SQL, uh, which is, I guess, a standard choice for relational databases. The Bokeh Python, we used a Python, is a Python visualization package. And then um, the, the final repository was in GitHub, uh, which is the code and infrastructure configuration repository. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we had a difficult time with the ontology piece. So uh, we were planning originally, they were planning, I should say, to use an unstructured database. But that was much more difficult than we uh, expected. And so they pivoted to a more traditional normalization and loaded into a structured database instead. Um, and that ended up leading to tables that were wide and sparse and lots of columns that didn't have data. Uh, but it seemed to be a more tractable way to do this. Next slide. Um, so accomplishments. Well, we really worked hard to understand one another, the languages of data scientists and uh, mercury scientists, um, and uh, understand the, for the, uh, the data scientists, they really need to understand the types of data that we actually generate. And then we were able to compile and harmonize these data sets from the different laboratories and field studies, and then um, produce a consistent attribute naming convention, which was, as I said, not a small task. We completed a data dictionary with mapping from the individual data sets, and we designed consistent spreadsheet templates, and provide, which um, provided dictionaries of terms of, of our data. Um, we also 
try to find the intersection points of the, the data that were ingested and were able to uh, at least start to address some research questions with the combined data. And we um, created the basis anyway for a central uh, database and uh, that we can extract data from and report. So, and then data quality checks uh, could be made on all the data that were put into the platform. Um, and then also finally uh, uh, developing an application template uh, for, for the database. La uh, next slide, please. And I, sorry, lo I've lost track a little bit of the time, but um, this is just an anal a couple analyses of what we were able to do with the whole data set, the platform. So, um, you know, one of the things I mentioned that methylmercury is really an important uh, species of mercury for us to understand because that's the bioavailable and toxic form. So one of the questions we wanted to know is, well, if we measure total mercury, do we actually see a relationship between total mercury concentrations in sediment and methylmercury concentrations? Because studies, um, many studies, seem to have very variable uh, outcomes for that that uh, analysis. And what you can see is that what we found is even though the percent of the total that is mercury spans three orders of magnitude, we do have a general trend of methylmercury being correlated with total mercury. But if you look at the different colored dots for each of these different systems from which these data come, you can see that the relationship is not something you could see necessarily with each data set. So this is something we would not have uh, seen so clearly without combining all these data sets together. On the other hand, we also wanted to know whether the percent of the total uh, mercury that's methyl is related to loss on ignition, which is a measurement of the amount of organic matter in the sediments. We thought that that might be true, uh, but in across these data sets combined, we do not see a relationship. So anyway, that's just an example of some of the initial uh, analyses that we're embarking on now. So uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the outputs and outcomes, we, uh, I think the short-term ones uh, that we've completed are what I just told you. We are in the intermediate, I guess I would say, writing a paper on these lessons learned because we really want to convey to our Mercury uh, colleagues, as well as all of those people working on mercury at the uh, global level on monitoring mercury uh, globally, the, uh, the lessons that we have learned, we want to refine our existing ontologies and share these data sets um, and really deploy the web portal. Um, how much we can do all of these things, uh, you know, has a lot to do with resources. Um, last slide, I think. So we learned a lot of lessons. We learned that seemingly small differences in the shape of the data, each of our labs produced data that came in different shapes, uh, really sometimes outsized the downstream effects. And uh, I learned that we really did have dirty data sets and they had to do a lot of cleaning of the data sets to even ingest them. Um, I'm not gonna, I'll just say the other lesson we learned is the lifetime of this repository is really uncertain because we're done with our external use case and we are trying to figure out how to actually continue to uh, make it available to other people. And then finally, designing a fair platform that's future-proof is really difficult. This effort really to do this um, was ended up allowing us to focus down on really specific research questions, but whether you can actually create a data repository that allows you to ask global questions, I think we are not really sure we uh, believe that at this point. And just a quote from my um, data scientist, he said, rather, uh, Dr. Arnold Sung here at Dartmouth, he said, rather than attempting to create a centralized database that requires contributors to adhere to strict data standards, which may take years to develop, it might be more useful and time effective to build tools and templates. The data sets could be stored in a central repository with, a good, with good metadata. Then the community could build and share data analysis tools and libraries that use these data. And this is a data model, he said, is really similar to one that's used by the geospatial community, uh, agencies like NASA. Uh, and USGS. So anyway, thanks for your uh, time and your attention, um, and I can take any questions.
Thank you, Celia. We do have a comment. Uh, very interesting presentation because of the extensive interactions with water systems. Did anyone on the team use the Python notebooks from the NSF initiatives with water hack weeks? We have found some of those tools useful for connecting geo, water, and health information. HydroShare is also a part of that effort. And as a Superfund Center, we are interested in talking with you more on lessons learned. And that's a from Elaine. Ah, um, so the first question, no, we had not heard about water hack. Um, I should say that uh, one of our colleagues um, in this group, uh, Dr. Rob Mason, he, he works a lot with NSF and NSF uh, larger sort of data platforms and um, brought to the table a lot of a sharing of how NSF has done things. Um, and I do think that some of that is something that uh, is useful to those of us in the geosciences and ecology uh, fields. Um, and HydroShare have not come across that. So these are great suggestions. I need to go look them up and find out um, more about those. I do. I did have the feeling from when we've had these EUC workshops with Superfund, which were really uh, educational for many of us, that the, uh, the, the approaches of different agencies is something that uh, would really benefit all of us to consider. Um, like I said, USGS and and NSF and NASA have the same kinds of, you know, issues as NIHS. So um, mm -hmm. I think we probably can learn from uh, these sister agencies. Yes, definitely. And there is a very similar community collaborative effort called the Earth Sciences Information Partnership, which uh, NASA and NOAA ended up helping to fund and seed uh, I think about a decade ago now, um, which is basically doing some of the very similar work that we are uh, mm -hmm. in terms of trying to facilitate data sharing, interoperability, reuse, et cetera. So, so um, Stephanie, is there a higher level interagency discussion being had? I just wondered. Higher in higher than NIH. Yeah, I guess I was wondering NIH. whether that discussion occurs at the interagency level. So that's actually going to be part of our conversation later this afternoon in terms of talking about the organizational structure for this proposed collaborative and how we do want this to not be a sole NIEHS. Uh, type of community initiative, but to make sure we are bringing in all of the relevant and interested partners, whether they be federal agencies, nonprofits, et cetera, anybody who is interested in this goal or, or mission towards an environmental health common language or harmonized language. Great. That's great. Okay. Um, Moving on then, thank you again, Celia. And Justin, now handing the podium over to you. Hey, um, so my name is Justin Reese. I'm a computational biologist here at Berkeley Lab. So I'm gonna talk about some work we've been doing uh, on machine learning, on knowledge graphs and ontologies. And I guess more generally, um, you know, the, the value of harmonized language um, in COVID-19 research and just how you go about extracting uh, actionable knowledge from, from heterogeneous data sources. So next slide. Okay, so yeah, this is sort of an exemplar that may be of interest to this audience. Um, so I'll describe KG COVID-19. That's, that's our knowledge graph for COVID-19 response. Um, this is a, a fair and open resource. Um, we published a paper on it, it's uh, links right there. Uh, the, the software and the knowledge gap itself are freely available for anybody to use. And this was sort of, so we, we um, stood this up fairly quickly uh, and it was targeted for our machine learning use case that I'll describe later. Um, and it sort of evolved also into a general tool for the COVID-19 research community. Um, and I'll say a little bit about that. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how we went about, you know, constructing the knowledge graph and then, and then trying to extract useful information about uh, drugs that affect COVID-19 outcome. Uh, we have a meta-archive preprint that you can read about there. Um, and then if I have time, I'll describe another uh, piece of software we, we wrote called NEAT, which is for reproducible graph machine learning. Uh, so next slide. 
So the challenge when, when we sort of dove into to the uh, to this problem um, was kind of one of, of assembling integrating the data. So there's as usual in data science, there's, we were just inundated with data even before the pandemic hit. There was a lot of data on the previous SARS, MERS, other coronaviruses, both pathogenic and non-pathogenic, and then you know the the pandemic hit and we were all inundated with all kinds of data so much that would make your head spin drug data uh, ppis sequence data go annotations epidemiological data and the list goes on and and so as of this was october so this is getting out of date october of last year there were eighty seven thousand papers uh on covid 19 and the doubling time at, the, at, at least at some point uh last year was 20 days so you know, lack of data certainly is not the problem. The data integration really is the the, the name of the game here. And the data, I mean, the problems, the challenges here were the data tends to be siloed, you know, it's trapped in text, you know, in scientific literature, or it's behind separate APIs. And, and you know, the list of file formats you have to deal with is, is pretty exhaustive. So um, next slide. So uh, by our reckoning, knowledge graphs are, are a good way of tackling this problem. So I'll sort of make the case of why that's a sensible thing to do. So if we consider a, a pretty simple question, you know, what FDA approved drugs target a human protein that interacts indirectly with SARS-CoV-2? This is sort of one our, was kind of our jumping off point for this analysis. Um, you know, if you consider what you would have to do uh, with the, the disparate data sets um, to answer this, you're talking about probably downloading several files and harmonizing them. You got to worry about ID normalization uh, and, you know, how you can actually query it. And But if you go to the trouble of setting up a, a knowledge graph, this is a, a fairly uh, a fairly easy graph query. So you can see I've sort of represented um, some some actual real hits that we got on our first analysis here. Um, and this is a pretty simple graph query that um, you can put together in a few minutes. Um, so next slide. Um, and so here's what co KG COVID-19 looks like. Um, so we we sort of centered this around obo ontologies that you probably are all familiar with hpo that's human phenotypes go you know all about that this uh, gene function in this context uh mondo is diseases um we have the chemical ontology kebi um and then sort of more uh public database sort of data that we integrated on proteins genes that's you know human proteins and uh, viral proteins uh, publications coming from the the core 19 data set um, several different drug databases and those describe drug typically drug and drug target interactions uh, phenotypes gene function ppi and and so um, what we're talking about here is uh, about somewhere around half a million uh, entities nodes and about 24 million relationships between them so edges in this in our knowledge graph uh, so next slide so as I said, we, we set this up for our ML use case, but it's sort of, um, I think has become a, sort of a general tool that was is used by uh, the COVID-19 research consortium, uh, uh, several consortia. So NVBL is a DOE effort that we were involved in um, to find therapeutics. Um, and this was, uh, well, I won't go into exactly what we were using it for, but it's sort of a way of, uh, uh, querying publicly available data about COVID-19. And then it's also been deployed in the, in the N3C consortium that Rick mentioned in the, in the beginning here. Um, and it sort of provides, uh, you know, access to publicly available data that can then be combined with patient level data for some analyses that um, I'll describe uh, an example of later. Um, next slide. So how do you actually go about extracting knowledge once you have this, this, this knowledge graph? So um, I'll sort of in schematic form uh, show how we did this. On the left side, you can see here's our, our knowledge graph represented schematically. We have about uh, 30,000 or so drugs in here. And then there's a node in there, obviously, that represents SARS-CoV-2. And you can apply uh, an algorithm called node vec to, to generate embeddings in low dimensional space. And what that means is basically you just you uh, sort of translate this into a uh, hundred dimensional space where the, where the point in, in space where that, where each node lands represents all the information we have about, about that, that node. And so the SARS-CoV-2 node will land somewhere and the drugs will land somewhere else. And you can sort of rank them how, by how involved they are with SARS-CoV-2 by uh, their distance in this latent space. Um, 
or you can do more complicated things uh, like link prediction. Um, if you do the latter, then um, one measure of how well that works is AU rock, and it works very well, it turns out. So uh, about roughly 90% of what you'd expect to find, you, you can actually find with, with link predictions if you do holdouts. Um, now, uh, so this obviously will get us ranked list of drugs, and, but we can't actually just start dispensing those to people. We have to, we want to know uh, we want some sort of orthogonal way of validating and uh, whether we are right about these drugs being involved in SARS-CoV-2. And also we wanna know if they actually help things or, or make things worse. And so um, one strategy that or the strategy we took was to do an observational study uh, called a retrospective case cohort study. Um, and so briefly it goes like this, you start with all the COVID-19 patients. Oh, sorry, we're doing this in N3C enclave, by the way. Uh, that um, I mentioned a minute ago. So you start with COVID-19 positive patients, and for each drug you do the following. You, you find patients with an indication for that drug. So if this was, a, for example, a migraine drug, these would be patients that have, uh, that have experienced migraines. And then you split them into, into patients that were treated with the drug and not treated with the drug. Um, you use a method called propensity matching to, to sort of uh, demographically match the treated and untreated. And then you just compare the COVID severity of you know, the people that were taking the drug and the people that were not taking the drug. Um, so next slide. So this is just a summary. If, if you look at the top 100 drugs that we ranked as I described uh, before. Um, uh, so what I'm showing you, let's see, on the top right is, is the p-values uh, as measured by the ordinal logistic regression. And, and so we're seeing some pretty good signals here, it looks like. And some of these odds ratios, so in other words, the treatment effects are, are, are actually pretty pretty profound. And the sample sizes also compare favorably with, with um, you know, what you might see in a, a random clinical trial or other observational studies. So next slide. So if you do this sort of thing, um, if you look at, just take a look at the, the, the signals that you get in the top 100, um, obviously some, some themes will emerge. Um, one theme, that, um, some of them are probably not surprising. You, you find in antivirals, you find uh, steroid hormones. Um, but one thing that intrigued us and we did a deep dive on was uh, we found three or I think four COX inhibitors in the top 100 and aspirin is one of the, an example of those. So these are typically, uh, but not always over the counter uh, analgesics. Um, and aspirin is it was eighth in our ranked list. And so if we if we consider uh, we, we asked the question in our retrospective study, what effect does aspirin have in COVID nineteen outcome? You can see uh, on the right there the odds ratio. That's probably what you want to what you want to look at. Um, the indication is sort of the sub cohort that we looked at, and you can see that. Um, aspirin is very clearly making things a lot worse. So um, an odds ratio, for example, among the migraine patients uh, of 3.47. So basically taking the drug, uh, you're three times as likely if you're not, than compared to if you're not taking the drug to move up to a higher level of, of COVID severity. Um, and so we, we did a fairly deep dive on uh, uh, a lot of other COX inhibitors, uh, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, you can read about that in the, in the preprint that I mentioned earlier. Um, but across the board, they were the, all the general COX-1 inhibitors were associated with more severe outcome. And intriguingly, the, the, there was a, another subclass of these drugs called, uh, that are COX-2 selective. So they, they inhibit um, selectively uh, one of the two isoforms. Of, of COX and those we did not see the signal. And so this is something we're following up on. Um, so next slide. Um, so this is just an example. This is kind of shifting gears a bit, but um, we, we made some software uh, called Meet that, that facilitates the sort of graph ML that you might want to do on, on knowledge graphs. Um, so the problem basically when we, when we did the analysis that I described just, uh, just now, um, the, the, it becomes a, a bit of a mess pretty quickly. So the workflows are scattered a bunch of, across a bunch of repo, repos. And then when you go to write up the paper, it's difficult to, to, exa to remember exactly what parameters you use. You know, where's that data set? Where's the code now? Um, and the, the Python code that we used um, was often repetitive and disorganized. And so our solution was to, to make the software stack called Neat. Um, so the, the aspiration here is to make this entirely YAML driven from a user perspective. So this also makes it more accessible to people who don't want to do programming. Um, and you basically just describe what you want to do in YAML format. So a text file that, that you can understand by just looking at it. 
Um, and then after you're done, um, it becomes a nice uh, sort of a provenance. Uh, you know, it describes exactly how the data that you're looking at was was generated. So this uh, leverages a lot of tools that you've probably heard of. Docker uh, KGX is is some software that we that we wrote here at Berkeley to 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 basically manipulate knowledge graphs. Um, TensorFlow in big and in small one are excuse me are uh, graph and graph library and our machine learning library. Um, those are also freely available and everybody's welcome to use them uh, and cyber. So I'll give you an example of, uh, of an experiment that, that shows how this works. Um, next slide. So here's, the, here's some data on uh, training an MLP uh, um, to extract some, some usable information from the, from the Go. So we start with Go plus, um, we, we turn that uh, into our uh, internal format of representing these data. Um, then we hold out 20% of the subclass of edges. So we just we basically hold out things uh, and see if we can find them with link prediction later. We apply node to VEC. And we also uh, apply uh, um, pre-built embeddings for class and name descriptions. Um, and so this is sort of node to VEC sort of captures the topology of the graph, if you like, and the cyber embeddings can capture the semantic information in, in class names and descriptions. And then we hand that off to an MLP classifier and try and find those subclass of edges that we had, the 20% of those edges that we held out. And if you do that, you can see that um, this is kind of uh, 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 an interesting observation. Um, if you it, you can ask the question, did the, the semantic information that we're getting from the cyber embeddings improve things? And uh, you can see that the, the uh, recall goes way up. So the, the BERT, cyber embeddings are actually helping a lot. And this is evidence that you know, including semantic information from the class names and description is helping a lot. Um, so next slide, I'm doing on time. So uh, there's a lot of work to follow up on the, on the things that I just said. There's, uh, like I said, the top 100 list um, is, we're still yet to, to sort of do a deep dive on all of the interesting hits we, we have on uh, those drugs that, that we were, that are in the top 100 list. Um, we're, uh, we're interested in, apply, in applying GraphML uh, to, to clinical data in the N3C enclave to address long COVID. Um, that's probably another story for another time. Um, and uh, we, we have some ideas and we have some tooling also to, to help align KG COVID-19 with other important biomedical knowledge graphs like a phenolator, Tiffany Callahan at Colorado is put together. There's also Monarch KG, which is a project we're involved in to, to address um, rare diseases. Um, and then uh, there's another related project called OntoML that, that uses NEAT to improve GraphML on ontologies generally. And that's something we're, we're interested in, you know, just the, the general problem of how to do GraphML on everybody's favorite ontologies. So the next slide. Um, so this was, uh, you know, obviously not my work alone. It was a huge team. Uh, Chris Mungle at Berkeley Lab helped out with um, all the ontology because uh, he's the ontology guru. Uh, other, a lot of other people at Berkeley Lab, uh, Google Cloud, and AMD both gave us a lot of in kind resources that uh, that helped us do what we described. Peter Robinson's group at Jackson Lab, uh, Hannah Blau um, did a lot of this work. Uh, Luca Capoletti and Tommaso Fontana uh, did a lot of the graph and the actual in the trenches graph ML that I described. Uh, Lauren Chan and Tiffany Callahan also helped a lot. And, and I'll take any questions. Uh, I'm unmuted now. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, do you have one quick question? So how could or not, um, oh, actually, I see another one in the chat. Let's go with this one. So how did you account for the situation that COVID patients with more severe disease would take increased TOX2 inhibitors due to their conditions, not because the COX-2 inhibitor drugs were causing more severe disease? And did you have temporal data that could start to sort this out? Or matching on disease severity that took and did not take these inhibitors? There's actually several questions buried in the one question. Um, this would seem to put the emphasis on the need for disease progression and severity. How comfortable did you feel with that data? 
Yeah, it's a good question. And this certainly gets to the heart of what uh, observational studies are hard. And the, the sorts of what you're referring to basically is called confounding. And that, that is uh, always the specter that is looming when you when you do observational studies. Um, we, we have a couple of follow up uh, experiments we're doing that pro probably would address the sorts of things you're talking about. So um, we have data in N3C about uh, dosage. So you can imagine, you know, a dose response uh, 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 relationship between the drug and the severity would, would probably give you a little bit more confidence that we're not being confounded. But um, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's a difficult problem, yeah. And there certainly are the limitations that, that you describe are, are there. Thank you, Justin. And now for our last speaker for this session, I'm handing it over to Jeanette. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, let's wait for my slides. Great. Um, so I'm going to be presenting more of the uh, environmental epidemiology perspective on how standardized vocabularies can help and why they are needed. Uh, next slide. So I uh, am going to be talking about the experiences from the HERE data center, and really that centers around the challenges of working with other people's data in trying to harmonize it as well as sort of understand it. I'm going to be presenting how we have chosen to use standardized ontologies to facilitate our harmonization and our sharing of that data. And I'll be giving um, some accomplishments to date, but also highlighting why this type of initiative is so important and why we really need community input to ensure that um, our initiative is successful. So next slide. So there was a brief introduction to HERE at the very beginning. Uh, so I won't go, and hopefully everyone has heard of HERE, the Human Health Exposure Analysis Resource by now. Um, I'm gonna just talk briefly about uh, the data repository itself. So all of the data that is generated by the HERE network um, uh, is, um, a is meant to be made available to the broader scientific community. Okay, and that's for two purposes. One is because we have all of these individual study level data, we want to be able for other researchers to be able to access those resources. All of these studies have been funded by NIH, so there should be um, you know, availability of that data. The second is that we can, once we compile all of that data together, we can use it somewhat similarly to how uh, Justin was just presenting about the creation of knowledge graphs to sort of get all of the information together so then we can query it using um, available, I'm just gonna call it software for now, right? And so these two um, goals, right, are really dependent upon our ability to harmonize across these different studies. And the really big challenge is particularly within here are that these are diverse studies of health, right? So there's no prior coordination, which means they don't necessarily have to be about the same outcomes. They often are not. They um, measure similar exposures, but not always the same ones, uh, not always in the same matrices. And the other part of here that makes it somewhat different than traditional harmonization initiatives is that our resource is growing, right? Studies are constantly coming into the HERE program and we don't know what to expect. And so as a result, our methods have to be both dynamic, dynamic and accommodate, you know, whatever can come down the pike at us. But again, right, the, the potential for this to pool data across different studies to address scientific questions, to um, expand our exposure variability, to look at smaller vulnerable subpopulations across different um, studies is, is really exciting, right? So we want to be able to share this data with people in the best way possible. At the same time, you can imagine that this is really uh, laborious. And so what we want, and what I want in particular as the person who does this, is for machines to do the most uh, laborious parts for us. Now, next slide. So the first challenge we face is, I'm gonna refer to it as insufficient metadata. Anyone who has a data set has probably gotten a data dictionary. Data dictionaries are how we describe our data. And we think we're using you know, even in just the English speaking world, right? We think we're using the same languages, but you know, but are we, right? So these are two studies. One is a pregnancy study and one is a childhood asthma study. I know that because I know these studies, but there's really nothing in the data dictionary that tells me that, that makes that aspects of the metadata explicit. You can also see that how people define their variables um, is very variable, right? So for example, in study one, we have this variable name percent body fat. 
the description measures from DXA, which I know means DEXA, but imagine if this is a computer trying to do this. There's nothing even in the description to describe that this is percent body fat. It's only in the variable. And I know that as a human reading this, that's not a big deal, but trying to program a computer, that makes this more complicated, right? And you can see, I can go through multiple examples from within these data dictionaries of how we're describing our data in ways that aren't necessarily compatible with the ability to use machines to, to sort of understand the knowledge that are contained within our data. Next slide. And the second challenge is really what we're talking about today, which is this lack of standardization or common vocabularies across studies. This is an example that we included in a paper from a while ago, um, just looking at maternal education. Mater education in the United States is pretty standardized, right? So this is something that you think we would describe all in the same way. And yet here are three different studies. Um, these are pulled from actual data dictionaries that describe education in very different ways. Sometimes, right, it's, it's about granularity, right, how much detail each study goes into, but it's really also about the words we use. For example, sometimes we do use the same words. You can see study one and study three, um, uh, both have college, right, college graduate, college degree. Those are equivalent, but how do we tell a computer that those are equivalent? The same thing with less than high school and less than 12 years. Again, as a human looking at this, this seems very Duh, Jeanette, like this is not complicated. This seems very simple. But imagine now you're a computer trying to realize this. How do we teach the computer that less than 12 years is less than high school? How do we teach the computer that less than high school is the same as less than HS? How do we teach the computer that less than 12 years is the same as less than 12 YRS? Humans have this uncanny ability to say the same thing in multiple different ways, right? And so again, this points to the need for standardized uh, terminology and common vocabularies. Uh, next slide. And so traditionally when we do pooling of data, we would take our three studies and we would find the commonalities by eye, right? And if this slide looks a little bit web-like and messy, it should be because this is a pretty messy process, right? You have to go within each study, right? This is traditionally how it's been done, mapping each study to each other which levels can be nested under another level so I can find the new variable that can encompass all three. And can I actually do that? Or will there be some levels, for example, like GED equivalency that won't fit anywhere, right? That aren't common anywhere across the three. This is just three studies on a variable as, as simple as education. Now take it to the 37, 38, 39 studies we currently have in here and now add the hundreds of variables we have in each studies. And you realize that this approach is impossible. Next slide. And that's why we're using standardized vocabularies. So what we do is instead of to harmonize mapping studies to each other, we map studies to our standard vocabulary and our vocabulary has structure. And I'm gonna get into that in a minute. So here we have two of those same studies again, um, where I have uh, some of the education levels listed and we map to a, camp, a common vocabulary or our here ontology. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our ontology in a minute. You can see that these are numeric codes. Um, if you're not familiar with ontologies, there are numeric codes with labels, but the codes are nice, right? Because that's a number, there's nothing about spelling, there's nothing about capitalization, um, although, well, there's something about capitalization when you define your ontology, but we're not going to go into that. Um, and so that makes it really easy for a machine, right? Really easy for a computer. And it's also easy for us as, easier for us as analysts who are doing this, right? Because we can very clearly say, yes, no formal education. This is the code for that. We do that now for all of the studies. Everything is mapped to this same vocabulary, our here ontology. And why it's important that our ontology has structure is because for example here, college graduate has a, a mapping, college graduate advanced degree has a different mapping. It maps to higher education, right? Because this study different, didn't differentiate college graduate and advanced degree. But college graduate is nested under that. So that does represent a commonality. By having a structure in our ontology, we can then program that in for a computer to recognize, aha, right? This, is actually, this actually does fall under that, and that could be harmonized. Um, and so our ability then, I mean, our practice of standardizing to this common vocabulary means now we can use software solutions. Now we can build knowledge graphs. Now we can query those knowledge graphs, and that is what's powering our data repository. 
Next slide. And so a little bit more about our standardized vocabulary, the HERE ontology. It's really this application ontology whose goal is to represent all of the knowledge within the HERE studies. Now, again, HERE studies are only limited by the fact that they are studies of human health and they have some type of environmental exposure that's been measured by the HERE labs. So this means that it needs to represent chemical, biological, as well as epidemiologic measurements. It has to represent familial relationships like mother-child or sibling linkages, also study design linkages like case control. It has to be able to represent multiple time periods within individuals and across individuals. And so we have a lot of work on knowledge representation that we're doing. Again, because we want our repository to be fair, which includes interoperable, we use existing ontologies. And so you can see on the right, a lot of ontologies that we use for specific concepts, right? We use KEBI, uh, uh, chemicals of biological interest for a lot of our, um, for all of our targeted analytes. We use the statistics ontology, cl clinical measurement ontology, uh, most are from the OBO foundry, but we make these decisions within here. And this is like a big place where we need community involvement, right? There's a lot of ontologies out there. What should we be using? Can we as a community sort of come to consensus on that? That would be really great. Uh, next slide. And if you're interested in the Here Ontology, it's posted on BioPortal. We update it um, quarterly at this point, um, pretty much as often as we're adding in new studies. And you can see that we cover really the depth and breadth of very diverse envir of environmental health studies, everything ranging from our targeted analytes to demographics to anthropometry. Uh, next slide. And so this, um, I'm not gonna talk about a lot, but this is how we map um, our, what's in a data dictionary to our ontology. We use something called semantic data dictionaries. And I've included um, a link to a paper that describes this process um, and these tools. And if you actually just Google it, um, you can find an online uh, demo of it where you can try it out with some NHANES data. Uh, next slide. And what that enables, what our accomplishments are, is that now if you go to the HERE data center, you get access to our repository, you decide which studies data you want. When you go to download it, you get a customized data set where everything has been harmonized to a common vocabulary. So that means for you, your download, this is just a mock-up, will have your study ID, and then everyone's, for example, a very simple variable, um, biological sex, can be, um, has the same codes. Right? So you don't have to worry about this study used 01, this study used MF, this study used something else. All of that is done for you. All of the column names are interpretable and understandable, so you clearly know what the data represent. Um, and what you can see here also are things where when things are different, they're separated. So for example, this study 34 gave us both continuous BMI data and categorical BMI data. Yes, they're both BMI, but they're not the same. You don't want to combine an 18 and this 99 code, right? And so it's very clearly separated there. And you can see more about um, our repository uh, on our website. Uh, next slide. Um, the last sort of accomplishment that I just wanted to highlight is that we can now harmonize data across these studies to make as comparisons to external resources. So this is just one example where we took um, PAH measurements from two studies, study B and study A, we're able to harmonize them because everything has been mapped to a common vocabulary and then compare them to NHANES to get at this, what is the here data repository look like compared to um, baseline exposures in children per NHANES. Uh, next slide. So um, I I'm hoping that just through my talk, you sort of got at what I was saying in terms of the challenges that would benefit from greater community, the prioritization of different ontologies, right? What should we be using to represent different concepts? How should we be representing our knowledge? And just encouraging the community to use common data elements and improving our metadata with standard vocabularies would really help this process along. It's difficult to harmonize and make data available and interoperable when we're not quite sure what the data are describing. Uh, last slide. So I just want to acknowledge the full here data center with everyone listed here um, and encourage you to please visit our website um, if you wanna know more about the repository and the methods that we're using. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jeanette. We are over time, as you can see, we were supposed to have a break at 2.20.
Um, but I think you will all agree that the presentations have been fascinating and very informative. So I think we're all happy that uh, we're a little bit over time. We'll, we'll make it up. Um, we have one question here, and that is, have the HERE studies been linked to any common data elements such as OMOP, CDE, or LOINC standards? That's an excellent question. So um, as of yet, the, the HERE studies have not. And the reason why is because uh, many of those common data elements get used with like clinical data. But we've been talking about that sort of interoperability of being able to think about research data. Let's say there was a study with electronic health record data. And so we've been talking about um, how we would do that and sort of where that would fit in to our work. And so our head of scientific computing, uh, Chip Masters, James Masters is on here too. And we've sort of had these conversations. Um, so maybe in a couple of years and finding some money, <laughs> uh, we'll be able to do that. Thank you for the question though. Okay, thank you very much, Jeanette. And now we will be taking a break. We were supposed to be returning to break right at this point. So if you don't mind, let's do a very short uh, bio break and return at 2.35. Thank you. Dr. Paul. Thanks, Kenan. Uh, Dr. Paul Thomas is trained in computational biology and turned to genomics as soon as the Human Genome Project pilot began in 1995. And the culmination of this early work was the, public, the publication of the paper that described the sequencing of the first human genome in 2001. Dr. Thomas led the work that was described in the 10-page section of the paper entitled An Overview of the Predicted Protein Coding Genes in the Human Genome. Since that time, Dr. Thomas's group has continued to innovate in the area of computational analysis of genomic data with an emphasis on gene function and evolution. In addition, Dr. Thomas is director of the Gene Ontology Consortium. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with it because it is one of the largest and best known bioinformatics projects in the world. Dr. Melanie Corteau is passionate about making data available in a structured and standardized way to enable answering complex integrative queries and computationally processed genomics knowledge. At the European Bioinformatics Institute, she designs tools to streamline multi-omic submissions and develops integrated metadata strategies across the Institute's archival resources and other projects. In the context of GA4GH, Melanie co-leads groups that are working on data access and encoding, as well as clinical and phenotypic standards. And then finally is Dr. Ann Thesson, who received her PhD in oceanography from the University of Maryland and gradually transitioned into data science during her postdocs with the Encyclopedia of Life and the International Census of Marine Microbes. In 2012, she started her own data science consulting company, which she ran until taking a faculty position at Oregon State University in the Department of Environmental and Molecular Toxicology. June 1, she started her first day at the Center for Health AI at the University of Colorado on Schutz Medical Campus. So with that, I will turn the virtual floor over to you, Paul. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Can everyone hear me and see my slides? That's great. Ready to go. Great. All right, thanks. So, uh, so I, I was asked to, to speak here today about the, uh, the communities. Uh, behind the founding and, 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 and growth of, of the gene ontology, just to sort of uh, think about some of the lessons we've, we've learned about our, our community and what, what really worked for us. Um, hopefully this will be useful to this community and I look forward to, uh, to fielding any questions you might have. All right, Let's see if we can get started. All right, so just a little bit of background on the gene ontology for people who may not be familiar with it or may, may, uh, may think of it a, a, in a slightly different way than we, than we think of it. Um, really, you know, the motivation behind the, the, the gene ontology is really, you know, to, to, to be able to handle, uh, you know, high throughput uh, analyses in, in biology. You know, as, as you all know, biomedical research experiments now routinely measure tens of thousands or, or more uh, genes or proteins or transcripts uh, at a time. And interpretation of the experiments obviously requires the use of, you know, a vast amount of, of, of accumulated knowledge that, that we already have about how these genes function, what, what they do, um, how these biological systems operate. 
Um, but the problem we have, of course, is that that knowledge is, you know, locked away in a sense uh, in, in hundreds of thousands of scientific papers um, in a place where it's, it's hard to get at. And frankly, you know, if you're, if you're a person, it's, it's impossible for you to read all of those papers. It's impossible for you to know it all, to keep up to date with it. It's a huge task. And the, the gene ontology is, is, is changing all the time because uh, of, of the, uh, the, the continued growth in, in the knowledge that we have about, about genes and gene function. So, you know, some of these example applications are transcriptomics, proteomics, metagenomics. I'm just showing a few just to give you an idea, but I think, you know, everybody has, a, has sort of a familiarity with the pro basic problems we need to solve. And so the, 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 the problem, obviously, you know, the solution is pretty obvious is to get a computer involved. Um, so we need to be able to, um, hang on a second. Okay. Yeah. So we need to uh, be able to get a computer involved and make this vast amount of knowledge computable. So it can't just be human readable uh, like Wikipedia, it has to be machine readable. Um, and that's really what we're trying to accomplish in, uh, in the gene ontology. And so you can kind of think of Go as a, as a Wikipedia at the interface between humans and computers where we structure human concepts uh, and knowledge in a, in a way that, 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 compute, that allows computers and humans to collaborate on, on data analysis. So that's, that's really the way we, we think of the, the, the gene ontology. And at the end of the day, we have a couple of products we produce, you know, with, I think famously, you know, there's, there's, there's the ontology itself um, that, that gives a structured representation of the universe of the possible functions that genes may have and, and the relationships between those functions uh, in, a, according to a lot of different uh, ways of classifying um, uh, functions. Uh, and then obviously the rubber hits the road when you uh, associate specific gene products with specific functions. And the structure for this has to, of course, uh, ha carry a lot of metadata around with it that allows you to see, you know, where does this, you know, what, what is the scientific evidence that this function, this assertion about the function of a particular gene, um, where, you know, where, where, what's the provenance, where does it come from? Uh, and, you know, how can it be, you know, uh, uh, communicated to, to end users? And so we, we you know, we, th we think of this as, you know, as essential is, is, is you know, having evidence behind all of it because, you know, this is science. Uh, we have to be able to revise our view um, as we go along, right? And so uh, we need to be able to add new terms, but also um, obsolete, uh, uh, you know, annotations and ontology terms as our knowledge uh, and conceptualization of science changes over time. Uh, the gene ontology has been around a long time, so there have been a lot of changes. Right? It's been around since uh, 1998. So um, we also have, uh, uh, you know, extended this, this uh, set of statements to include linked statements uh, in these GoCam, what we call GoCam, Go Causal Activity Models. I'm not going to get into uh, much about that, but there's a, there's a recent um, uh, paper in Nature Genetics for those who are interested. Okay. So, and again, you know, it's pro probably obvious to this group, it's, it's, it's extremely highly used. This is a third party analysis uh, that's, that, that's been published about the gene ontology and it's used in, in you know, not only the, the biology uh, literature, but also the medical literature um, extremely, uh, at extre an extremely high rate. And, uh, and, and it continues to grow and actually continues to grow uh, exponentially. The, the number of publications that mention gene ontology. Um, this, this looks like a, cu a cumulative statistics graph, but it's not. This is, this is year by year. Uh, and, and we're currently, we're, we're doubling the number of, of uh, publications that mention Go uh, every four years or so. All right, so, so, so to, to understand the gene ontology and the, and the success of it, it really is because there is a massive community ecosystem behind it. It is not one person, it's not one small group. It's a really large uh, distributed and coordinated effort uh, among a huge number of groups. And that's, that's something you really have to, to, to understand behind it. And, and I'll, I'll try to get into uh, in the next few slides, uh, some, of the, some of the elements of success that I think underlie the building of this community. But you can see that the community includes 
Uh, and so these really should all be two-way arrows. So I'm sorry for, for, for this, the way this, this figure finally turned out. But obviously other ontologies are involved. There's a huge number of, of different groups that contribute to both the ontology uh, and, the, and the assertions or the, the annotations. Um, and these are all shown around here. Um, and then obviously we have interactions with the community. Uh, it's very you know, user focused with obviously you have the bio, biomedical research community, um, software tool providers, gene ontology is used in a massive number of software tools and we have a community of um, tool providers that we, that we work with. And obviously we have to maintain things like APIs and, and data access for um, stable releases, uh, release cycles with DOIs and this sort of stuff. Uh, and then obviously redistribution of the gene ontology. So it's redistributed through a lot of different uh, resources, and so that's that. That's another connection we have with the community. So it's a it's it's a big and and coordinated effort. So, so what are some of the elements of success? And this I I hope will be will be useful to everybody here. Um, one obviously, as I as I've just been hinting at, is the clear user community, and you know that means that there's a demand on on the user side. So you know it's you know it's pretty pretty clear that the demand that's driving. Uh, a lot of the gene ontology, at least in the early days, um, was, uh, was, was that killer app of, of doing enrichment analysis uh, and analyzing large sets of genes that came out of these, these large scale experiments. But now, of course, what's been added to it is a massive range of applications in biomedical data science. Um, and we, we saw some examples of that in the previous, previous session. Um, and, and, you know, and then, you know, the, the other element, as I, as I said about the community, is that there's a large community of content creators adding knowledge to the knowledge base. Uh, so it's not just, you know, a, a, a small effort. Um, there are Go annotation groups, um, the founding members, so it started as three members, um, which were MGI, SGD, so Saccharomyces, and, uh, mouse, mouse Genome Informatics, Saccharomyces uh, Genome Database, and Flybase. Uh, and now there are over 20 groups that that, that contribute um, to the uh, to, to the knowledge base uh, on a regular basis, and all sorts of ways in which community uh, members, you know, just the wider, broader community uh, interacts and, and is able to give us feedback and 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 uh, and information that we can that we can uh, use to 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 uh, enrich the the knowledge base. So it's a really large effort. Uh, another element of success is obviously this, this focus on end users. And I think this is, this is something we, we talk about all the time in, in, in gene ontology, which is we try to be pragmatic. Okay, you know, it's, it's, it's lovely to be theoretically rigorous and perfect. Um, and obviously we strive to do that. Um, but we also recognize that, you know, having something in a user's hand is, is often better than nothing. And so we really believe in, you know, getting our, our you know, get, getting, you know, our releases in the hands of the users as quickly as possible uh, and get that sort of cycle of feedback that allows us to iteratively and systematically improve the resource over time from actual use cases. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's great to have something that's, that, that's, that's theoretically rigorous. And as I said, you know, that's exactly what we strive to do. Um, but we also have, you know, practical applications that we're trying to support. Um, and this is really important. And so, you know, one of the ways you can support that is to have relatively simple data, data formats uh, and, and, and modes of access for users. Obviously, you know, you've got, you know, APIs with full access to your sort of power users. Um, but you have to think about, you know, what the, what the simpler um, uh, formats might be that, that address particular use cases that your community has. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, uh, of, of sort of how we handle concepts and terminology, the idea is really to, to adopt and formalize. You know, we're really trying to build a formal representation of the existing concepts in the field. So, you know, we're not trying to invent a new conceptualization. We're trying to take the conceptualization across, you know, obviously lots of different communities, uh, you know, that, that have their own uh, domain of biology that we're trying to integrate into a really large model of biology. Um, but, uh, but, but we're trying to take those concepts and terminology that are used by the community uh, rather than dictating new ones. And, and what we rely on very heavily are definitions. 
So we have careful definitions that are written for every term. A lot of people think of you know, gene ontology terms and the term labels that we give them, but often we'll choose a label that's, that, that's, that's commonly used by the community, which means you'll see some labels that look very similar, but mean something quite different and, and, you know, because they're used by different communities. And so, you know, we, we, we try to make sure that we handle that at the level of definitions, rigorous definitions of every term that are human readable, but importantly, not just human readable, but machine readable. So we try to also build definitions using logical axioms. So we define terms uh, relative to, to their relations to other concepts so that essentially the ontology builds itself. Uh, and so this is really something, you know, the, the, the way we think about, you know, maintaining a really large uh, ontology. Another element of success, obviously, is that it's an open consortium. Okay? It's been open from the beginning. It's inclusive and not exclusive. Uh, we have in-person meetings with straw man proposals. It's really important to get, you know, in a large group to come forward with a proposal and allow, you know, really vigorous debate. Uh, I'm sure there, there are people actually I know in this meeting who've, who've been to go meetings and they, we can have really long and passionate discussions. And that's one of the things that drives the project. Um, and we really strive ultimately for unanimous decisions, which means you're going to have some long discussions, um, but it's a fantastic way to get people together, really think through problems and, and come at it from many different angles. Uh, and, and I can't str stress enough how important in-person meetings are. You know, as much as I've learned to love Zoom in the pandemic era, I think we all have, it's just not the same as, um, as having in-person meetings. And it's really, we still do them twice a year and it's proved to be really critical to, to the success of the, the consortium. Um, the other way to think about your resource is it's a living resource. It is not one and done. You're never quite finished and it's never quite what you want it to be. And you're always trying to improve it, but also, you know, not scientific knowledge is always moving on. So you got to build in from the beginning, the, the, the fact that you've got to be responsive and agile to changes and tracking revisions, obsoletions, extensions. Um, Obviously, you want to be able to adopt the new new technologies as they come along, and we've come a long way. You know, gene ontology has been around a long time, and I think there are probably many people here who might think of it still as a controlled vocabulary. Um, but it's you know it's now full ontology using the OWL standard, um, uh, and which allows us to do all sorts of automated reasoning uh, on the ontology, things that we could not do when we first built it. And then finally. Uh, you want to adopt the user-driven extensions to your data model. So initially, you know, we thought about classifying genes and people were operating with groups of genes, but obviously there's a lot of information about how gene products and, their, and they, how they function together and how they, they, they work as pathways or larger systems. And this again is an extension that we've, we've, we've recently made. And so these are the sorts of things that you have to be able to do to keep a resource um, uh, in line with current uh, conceptualizations. The other thing that's really important, and I think we saw a lot of this, was building on expertise, existing sources of expertise. Again, I probably don't have time to go into all of these, uh, but we've, we've sought out expertise where we don't have it. So we need you know, information about chemicals, cell types, tissues, all of this stuff, and, and we, we recruit a whole community to do this um, and collaborate with other expert communities. So that'll give you an idea of sort of the, 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 the elements, I think, that, that have contributed to the success of Go um, is really this openness, uh, inclusivity, and you know, constant collaboration and engaging uh, highly motivated users. So thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Appreciate it. Uh, we have time for maybe one question. And I'm checking chat. Um, you said that early on in the project that there were workshops to define the scope of the yeah. project. Could you um, give maybe a, a few examples of the kinds of things that you needed to define? Yeah, I think so. So, so I think this is this, this is something that that I think you know is is, is how you get a, a project set up and started and build a build, start building that trust in the community is to really have the discussions about. What are the you know what are, what are the objects that you need to deal with and what are the concepts you need to deal with? So for us, obviously, it's it sounds so obvious in retrospect. You know what is it even we're going to be annotating? Uh, 
you know, what do we mean by a gene? Well, we don't really, a gene doesn't really have a function. So it's really a gene product that actually performs some activity in a cell, like a non-coding mm -hmm. RNA or protein. And once you've decided what the object is, how are you going to refer to them stably? You know, what identifiers are you going to use? Similarly with the concepts in the, in, in the ontology, um, you know, you have to think about um, you know, what are the concepts that are, that are used in that field and how, you know, in our case, it was, you know, how, how do, how, how is function even conceptualized when it's, when it's uh, used to refer to genes? So again, it's, you know, it's, it seems obvious in retrospect that these, the, these sort of initial discussions, you'd be surprised at how lively the, the discussions you can have over, over what seem like obvious concepts, because people conceptualize things a little bit differently and, and reaching a community consensus is, is a process. Thank Great. You. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks. All right, Melanie, uh, you're up. We look forward to hearing about GA4GH. Yes, thank you, Stephanie. Um, all right, so thanks for having me here uh, tonight. Um, I was asked to talk about, to, to talk about my experience on uh, building some semantic standards for the, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, GA4GH. Um, so I, I will try not to talk very much about the, the technical details and the implementation, but rather think about how we went about building those standards and which lessons we learned as we were building them uh, in the hope that it would be helpful to uh, this community as well. On the next slide, please. The, the GF4GH uh, vision is really about bringing together those large virtual cohorts of uh, millions of people uh, based on the idea that by 2030, over 300 million genomes will have been sequenced. And the ability to build those huge cohorts of data, and we've seen examples a little bit earlier on, will really help us have uh, understand uh, human research and impact human health. And when I, when I look at this vision statement, it really reminded me of the, the man to the moon vision from Kennedy, who said, you know, We'll send a man to the moon and back by the end of the decade. It's really similar. By 2030, we'll build those giant virtual cores. And I thought it'd be interesting to try and build in parallels between um, sending a man to the moon and, and the own space trip and the little GF4GH rockets um, as we went about. On the next slide, please. So the, the very first uh, lesson, I think, from GF4GH. So this is a this is a picture of Mars taken from the, the Chinese Tianwen probe. And obviously we didn't just wake up and say, hey, let's go take pictures of Mars. We had to build on previous expertise, previous knowledge, to build a new longer reach probe, to have higher imaging capabilities and be able to take a high resolution uh, picture. And on the next slide, very much uh, similarly, when I started building the GA4GH data use ontology, uh, I didn't start from scratch. So I, I, I remember the, the start of the project when I was talking with uh, my colleagues at uh, the European Genome Phenome Archive uh, in 2016, and they were telling me, you know, it's really hard to qualify data use uh, limitation on a human controlled access data sets. And I was like, hey, this is really cool because, you know, codifying human knowledge into something that's machine readable ontologies and knowledge representation and knowledge graphs is really something that I, I really enjoy doing, as you've heard as uh, Stephanie described earlier, and I thought this is a great opportunity to step in and try and help and address this need for a uh, better representation of data use limitation. Um, and a little bit like uh, Steve described early on, I really didn't want to either reinvent the wheel, duplicate existing efforts, and so I, I started by looking at what was out there, and there were already a couple of efforts. Um, there was a consent code paper uh, here by uh, Dyke et al, which was itself building on uh, NCBI vocabulary, um, but that was a paper, so that means, you know, it's a table in a PDF, it's not machine readable, it's not extensible, as uh, Paul was just describing. Um, there was also the, the ADAM matrix for automatable uh, data discovery matrix, which had a slightly different scope, trying to represent everything uh, in terms of data use access, and then consequently was more complex, and uh, the format, again, was not quite working. So we said, you know, let's build on those resources. Uh, we actually also build on expertise from the developers and we've started developing the GA4GH data use ontology, which was approved as you can see here as a, a GA4GH product in uh, 2019. And on the next slide, 
Uh, this is just really a, a very small example of what the data use ontology is uh, and how it is used. So you can see on the left hand side, data depositors will interpret data use restriction from the constant form associated on the data. And they will tag the data set with the corresponding geotails, here the little tags in the middle, uh, when they deposit the data into archives. So for example, some data sets are uh, consented for health and biomedical research, some data sets are consented for uh, cancer research only, and so on and so on. And then on the other hand side, on the right hand side, when a, when a researcher tries to request data and say, hey, I'd like to access data set A, and I am doing uh, health and biomedical research, or I want to study melanoma, we can, uh, a data access committee in the middle can uh, either manually or automatically make the match between the requests and the restrictions. So the interest was uh, codifying uh, on both sides and be able to, to map uh, between both. On the next slide, so similarly, if we look back at uh, the expertise and the benefits of having shared format to store genomic information uh, on the left hand side here, the GA4GH clinical phenotypic uh, group started working on the phenopacket format. And it was really about uh, being able to have a structured format to enable standard sharing of case level uh, phenotypic information. So I will use those two examples um, throughout the, the next slides. On the next slide, please. The, this is another example of what the phenopacket standard actually looks like, a little bit less abstract. So as I mentioned, it's a, it's a shared standard and it's a structure to allow you to encode those entities of relevance and link them to the specific case and patient. So here's an example of a biosample. So you can see there's attributes like uh, the type of tissue that was used uh, or the age of collection. Uh, the, the diagnosis on the individual, and again, all of those, as you've heard in past presentations, linked to standard vocabularies and ontologies. We've heard about uh, Uberon and others. So we're, we're trying to have a structural standard and a formalism uh, underpinning it for uh, exchange of phenotypic information. On the next slide, please. So if I, if I think about the second uh, lesson, which I, I think Paul described very uh, rightfully just now as well, it's really about engaging your community. So this is a, a picture of the control room for the Apollo 13 mission. And uh, as I suspect we all know, the, the crew really run into big difficulties and they really had to rely heavily on the, on the crew on the ground and the experts and engineer on the ground to be able to make it back to Earth. And without that extra support and that extra community, things may not have uh, ended as well as they did. On the next slide, please. So similarly, if we look at the development of fellow packet, which I just talked about, this was not done in isolation. This is not somebody just waking up and saying, hey, I'll start building fellow packets. So we, we've really polled many communities for use cases, and we've heard example of uh, communities and uh, use cases collection from Charles, for example. And it was really about making sure that whatever we ended up producing was something that would answer our actual needs and requirement. Uh, you know, rather than falling into the over modeling uh, rabbit hole and also consider as we were developing final packets, consider how they would be used by those different parties through the whole workflow uh, of final packets. So you can see that there's different type of people using them, uh, physicians or patients, and they're used in different uh, type of environment and for different purposes. So for uh, discovery, if you want to search in journals or for patient matchmaking, if you're looking at uh, patient registries, for example. Uh, on the next slide, please. So the, the, the other example I was talking about, the, the data use ontology. Uh, so as I, as I was starting to develop the data use ontology uh, at uh, EBI in 2016, at the, the GA4GH plenary the same year, uh, Anthony uh, Filipakis from the Broad presented uh, tools on um, building an automated mapping system between data access request and data use limitation. And that probably sounds familiar now. And so there was an obvious overlap. And nonetheless, as their system was called uh, DUOS for data use oversight system. And then, you know, we said, hey, we're not competitors, let's work together and make it a collaboration. And we started that collaboration uh, with the Broad Institute and actively seeked use cases and interested parties. So they've used the DUO model in their DUO system. And that gives us really the both, uh, both best of both worlds because we have 
a standard shared model and an implementation showcasing how it can actually be used. Um, so this, uh, this map shows the current implementation of Duo and really there was a huge effort of outreach, use case collection, helping people understand the standard, implement it uh, locally in their resources. And there's a huge list of uh, Duo contributors on our uh, GitHub re repository. And I, I, I know that some of them are here. I saw uh, Becky Boyles and I see uh, uh, Yulin connecting earlier. So thank you for helping us develop Duo. And another point is that by engaging your communities and building those efforts on a global scale, hope, hopefully this will help somewhat alleviate the sustainability issues that uh, Celia mentioned earlier. So there's really multiple facets and advantages in trying to uh, reach out as uh, much as you can and as soon as you can. Um, and the final, uh, final point I wanted to raise on the next slide, thank you, was really about build up, you know, when, when Kennedy stated his vision of sending a man to the moon and back, they didn't Im immediately take one astronaut, put it in a rocket and press the fire button, right? Say, hey, good luck and come back. The, a lot of work was done beforehand, building up step by step, choosing the right fuel, choosing the right rocket, choosing the right suit. It, it, it was an incremental build up and testing and learning and going back and doing it again. And if on the next slide, if you look at the parallel with the data use ontology, so I told you how a data depositor need to interpret existing consent form information to tag the data set as they deposit it. That's obviously a, a subjective process because the, the PI of the study or will have to decide, okay, this is what that patient consented to and this is how I will tag it. So we've extended the DUO standard uh, with the, what we're calling the machine readable consent guidance, which is just an extension of the pipeline on the left-hand side to add that little mapping step between consent form and DUO terms. And that's all uh, built deep uh, now. And on the next slide, similarly, the, the same is true for phenol packets. So while the current phenol packet's really good at representing case level information, there's not really a, a cohort of population comprehensive message at the moment. And having that type of uh, packets on the right would allow us to do things like uh, aggregated statistics on cohort content, for example. Uh, on the next slide, um, so leveraging that idea of uh, cohort and harmonization, and I uh, really like your talk, Janet. Um, it, it, we just set up a cohort representation subgroup in uh, GA4GH, which I, I co lead with uh, Sashil Varma from HDR UK. And this is really an example of use case that we are trying to address for cohort representation. So it's about harmonizing those different data dictionary that uh, types Janet presented earlier and loading them into a cohort browser to enable that discovery at scale. So this is an example of a browser where you can do faceted search. So you can search for uh, cohorts that have specific type of data, for example. Um, and then on the next slide, uh, so wrapping it up and trying to think about what you would need to build your own bespoke trip to space. So really remember, start by reviewing the state of the art and identifying the gaps rather than just starting and building it all de novo. Um, engage with your competition. We've heard a lot about you know, building interoperability and bridging to other resources. And uh, finally, as you layer up and build incrementally, at some point you will fail, but it's best to fail fast, fail early, learn what went wrong, have a retrospective look and think, okay, I can do it differently and it will be better and I've learned from what went wrong. And on my uh, last slides, um, I wanted to thank all the community that have contributed to those, to those efforts in particular uh, from GA4GH and uh, EBI. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Appreciate that. Uh, we have perhaps time for one question. You want to put that into the chat? So. Melanie, perhaps I'll, I'll go ahead and start with one. Uh, based on your experience, now that you can look back on everything, uh, what do you think you would do differently? What were sort of maybe some um, other lessons learned about how you could have started off uh, the process a bit differently? Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. I think, I think I would have done what you are doing. 
which is, you know, trying to engage a little bit earlier with those various communities. So we ended up, um, when we when I started working on, on the data use ontology, you know, I said I had a look at what was done before, but that was not exactly at the beginning. So that was a little bit further down the line. I was like, oh, yeah, I can totally build an ontology and codify those really easy pieces. It's going to be quickly done and very efficient. But then I was like, OK, there are already resources. So, you know, I, I had a first version and I had to go back and, uh, you know, engaging with those different communities earlier on, I think would have uh, strengthened the initial proposal and uh, increased buy-in. Great. Thank you again, Melanie. And now I'd like to turn it over to Anne to learn more about the Research Data Alliance. Hello, thank you everyone. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides here. All right, wonderful. So I'm going to speak today about community building under the Research Data Alliance umbrella. You may have heard of Research Data Alliance by the term RDA. <clears throat> That's the abbreviated version of it. Um, and RDA is an international member-based organization focused on the development of infrastructure and community activities to reduce the barriers to data sharing and exchange. Uh, you can learn more about RDA at rd-alliance.org. There are over 11,000 participants in RDA from over 145 countries, as you can see over here on this map. And RDA works or organizes itself into several different types of groups called working groups and interest groups and communities of interest. And right now there are about 93 of these groups working on global data interoperability challenges. The mission of RDA is to build the social and technical bridges that enable open sharing and reuse of data. So you can see that most of the RDA members come from academia or research, uh, followed by government and public services. And most RDA members are from Europe, followed by North America. So RDA has a plenary meeting every six months, and they have a website with uh, discussion forums and email lists that these different groups can use to communicate in between these in-person plenaries. The uh, various groups, like I mentioned before, working groups, interest groups, um, have different uh, remits and have to do different types of tasks on different timelines. So if you have a working group, then you have a very focused group that has 18 months to produce a deliverable. And these groups typically meet at, at every plenary. Um, the interest groups are much more open-ended. Uh, they don't have a set ending date and they don't really have any set um, deliverable that they are expected to develop. They're, Typically, they just sort of explore a topic and they can spawn working groups when they identify something that they would like to, to accomplish. And, and here you can see on, on, the, um, on the right, a couple of different deliverables that have been produced by RDA working groups. And so, as I mentioned, there are about 11,000 people involved in RDA with 93 of these different groups. Uh, so it can be very difficult to kind of orient yourself uh, when you first start trying to participate in RDA. And so I'm gonna speak about my own experience with this organization and how, um, so I, I joined as um, a fellow in the very beginning and not in the very beginning, I think I started going maybe a, a year after it started and uh, got more and more involved and gradually became chair of a working group and, and produced deliverables. So I'll, I'll speak about my experience with that, uh, especially as related to community building. 
And so the first thing, if if you or anyone else wants to participate in RDA, is you have to sort of figure out where you fit in in this large organization. And so every plenary, there is a, a very brief meeting slash workshop called RDA for newcomers, where everyone or, or people like explain what working groups are and what all the processes are. There's also a website uh, that can be a little difficult to find things in still, but um, all the working groups, all of the uh, recommendations and the deliverables are all there for you to look at. Um, and so once you kind of figure out where you are, um, I, you know, my very first RDA meeting was spent just a, a going to meetings and, and trying to figure out which one, uh, the one where I could be the most impactful. And that for me was the biodiversity interest group. Um, and so I participated in this group and it took about a year to decide, for the group to decide that we needed a working group to develop metadata standards for the attribution of digital and physical collection stewardship. And that was the working group that was spun out of the biodiversity interest group. And I, myself and two other people were chairs of this working group. We also um, had, here's where things get a little unusual. This working group was a joint effort between another existing biodiversity standards body. Um, so you might ask, why would you even bother with RDA then if you already have a standards body? And the advantage that you get with participating in RDA is that even if you already have a community um, or a venue for developing standards, RDA can help you to expand beyond your typical community. And it provides you with a space to get work done every six months. And it's really, it, it like puts a, a flag in the ground and, and a deadline on your calendar so that it can, it, it really helps you to actually get work done in a timely fashion. And the recommendations from this working group are now being adopted by the uh, Distributed System of Scientific Collections, which is a large European effort uh, to harmonize data across um, all the different museums. And so um, the process of creating a working group involves coming up with a case statement. So you, you'll say what you want to do, why it's important. And the organization requires that you have 18 months and that you produce some deliverables at the end of those 18 months. And they also have an emphasis on adoption of the recommendations. So they don't want people to just show up and do something and then nothing happens to those recommendations. You need to be working with the potential adopters from the very beginning. And once those 18 months is over, you can um, just end your working group or you can go into sort of like a maintenance mode where you meet less frequently to update your recommendations. My uh, working group specifically, because it was a joint working group, we completed the RDA phase and we have our recommendations. And now those recommendations are going to the more focused uh, TADWIG biodiversity standards body to then make them, uh, to get them approved there. So that's where we are with that, with that process. And so was RDA worth it? Like I said, it did provide an imposed deadline and regular six month meeting intervals. So we were able to actually we had motiv motivation to get something done and it, it was very helpful. We also had ver uh, increased perspectives across disciplines and across uh, cultures and, and different places across the globe. For example, if we had done this work just within our biodiversity standards organization, we would have missed all of the input that we got from people who work with art collections or anthropology collections or even geology collections. And, and there's a, a lot of overlap between those collections. So we would have had an unnecessary silo if we had not done that. Also the process of going through the drafting of the case statement and the approval process within RDA 
required that you provide a certain degree of context so that you're not just creating these standards. You have to say these standards will relate to, to this thing that already exists or this thing will um, uh, relate, will uh, use this thing that already exists. So you're not duplicating effort and you're not creating unnecessary silos. But another note, you know, we did not start our community in RDA. We had an existing community that did things outside of RDA, but RDA was a very good tool for us to use um, so that we could do focused work and hear more perspectives. So with that, I can take questions and I think I saw something in the chat. Yes. Thank you, Anne, appreciate it. Uh, yes, Elaine did make a comment, uh, basically a testimonial such as yourselves about the uh, tremendous benefit of working within the RDA framework. And um, that she considers it to be the single most exciting data community to work with now. So <laughs> that's a pretty high level endorsement. Uh, are there any other questions? Please put them into the chat. And I guess I could start off with one for you, Anne. Do you think, I guess, trying to understand what are certain types of use cases and questions that can benefit from working within the RDA model versus perhaps doing something more uh, on your own? So I think that really all of our use cases would benefit. So it's not really like a use case focused thing. I found that you bring a topic to RDA when you want to hear opinions about it that are outside of your discipline or outside of your research culture or even your just regular culture. Um, and I know that, for example, the Europeans are doing a lot of work in this environmental health vocabulary space. And I'm not sure where else we would be able to hear about it um, unless we did have a, a um, presence at RDA. So it's probably less about the use case and more about just wanting to get more perspectives on any given use case. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, I appreciate, appreciate you all hanging in there. I know it's already been uh, quite a few hours already. And we would like to transition now actually to focusing more on those specific details for the proposed Environmental Health Language Collaborative. And we have left time towards the end to open the floor for discussion and begin getting input from you to help shape the development of this community. Or as Melanie mentioned, right, um, getting that teamwork to define and make our dream work. So uh, with that said, Next, please. Before I delve into those details, I do want to briefly show you how today's webinar and the use case meetings that Charles mentioned are going to be feeding into that September workshop. So feedback from our discussion today, as well as your input on the community survey will provide the basis for the first track. And that track is focusing on essentially building that sustainable community. We're going to be further refining the collaborative's vision, mission, goals, as well as more deeply delving into creating an action plan or a roadmap for how we can best organize ourselves in order to meet our agreed upon goals. The draft use case packages that are coming out of those use case events and the input on a use case survey will inform content for the second track, which is developing solutions. And that is going to be a more interactive sort of workathon format where we will be defining those specific needs and initiating development of the semantic oriented solutions that can address those needs. Next. So putting together these workshops and drafting the straw man for the collaborative has been a collaborative effort in its own right. 
And I would like to acknowledge the contributions of my fellow colleagues here at NIEHS, as well as from several contractors that are providing planning and logistics support. And to ensure that we weren't developing this approach in a vacuum, especially since this is, after all, intended to be a, a community-driven effort, we sought out preliminary feedback from seven community advisors, basically to give us a, a reality check to see if we were on the right path. And I would like to give an extra thank you to those advisors that Charles mentioned who are championing the draft use cases. Okay, well, good news is we aren't starting this initiative from scratch. We have had two previous workshops that began identifying the challenges and the needs in environmental health sciences field. And they were very productive in defining some useful next steps. And we want to build on those activities and make sure that we do so in a sustainable way. Next. So how do we create a sustained community? Well, we did some homework and we interviewed people familiar with the origin story of four successful communities listed here to learn why and how those communities formed and to understand basically those essential components or actions that we need to do to make sure that we form, grow, and sustain our own effective EHS language community. And as a result of these interviews, we distilled several teeth key takeaways that you um, can see here. And one that I would like to emphasize is we heard multiple times not to reinvent the wheel. And that will come up again in a few slides. Next. So at this point, I would like to highly emphasize that everything that follows is being proposed. Nothing here is final. Uh, rather than having the EHS community begin discussions from a blank slate, we thought it might be easier to start with some draft content as a beginning point. So with that said, NIEHS is proposing the formation of an environmental health language collaborative whose vision is to leverage community-driven environmental health language standards to catalyze knowledge-driven discovery and improve public health. Its mission would be to advance integrated environmental health research by developing and promoting adoption of a harmonized language. Next. The following very overarching goals are being proposed. The first would be to identify those use cases and needs and subsequent gaps that can benefit from applying knowledge organization systems. And by that, it's the the entire expanse of vocabularies, terminologies, and ontologies. Second would be to foster that community-based development of said knowledge organization systems, to develop and promote methods and tools that will encourage and make it easier for harmonized language or harmonized approaches to be used, to apply language standards, and best practices for accurate health data and knowledge representation. And then finally, to cultivate a vocabulary aware environmental health community through training and education. And especially to convey that it's beneficial, not just for data sharing and reuse and interoperability by others outside of a lab, but also for those within a lab that can benefit from this. If you think about the researcher who needs to revisit his or her data after a few years, or the new postdoc that might be coming in and is reusing or incorporating a predecessor's data set. Next. To achieve this mission, the Environmental Health Collaborative will undertake three key roles. The first one is, at the very least, we want to create a community of practice that provides a space for exchanging information, ideas, and expertise, such as we've been doing already through this workshop, as well as offering a clearinghouse of resources that would support the use of a harmonized language. And then finally, that community of practice would be a place where we advance the appreciation for and adoption of semantic approaches through education and training. The second component is to serve as a hub to really coordinate activities 
that would identify those use cases and gaps, prioritize where effort would be placed on activities, and define strategies and approaches for how we can better enable data sharing and interoperability in environmental health sciences research. The last element would be a platform where interested parties would actually then come together and take those strategies and approaches and begin building and developing those solutions that would address the identified use case needs. In addition, we recognize that there is a need to promote the social elements, so incentives, metrics, et cetera, that are needed to support successful adoption and use. Next. The next question then becomes, how do we organize ourselves? This is a very high level draft model and more specifics of how it would actually work in practice uh, or perhaps even discussions around other models that we could use will be part of the discussion at the September workshop. I'm merely conveying it now just to give you some high level information. So the model would begin with individuals or groups from discipline specific communities that would be generating those use cases based on the research questions that are of interest to them. And those use cases represent a specific need for a semantic solution that would enhance the findability, sharing, and or interoperability of EHS data. Going back to the lessons learned and not reinventing the wheel, the proposal is to leverage RDA and its infrastructure that you heard and talk about. We think that it is a good fit given that its mission aligns uh, with the collaboratives, as well as the fact that there are other related disciplines that are working within RDA, such as earth sciences, chemistry, and others that are also working on very similar issues and challenges. So these use cases would be brought to an RDA environmental health language interest group and that IG would provide the nexus for those three roles I just talked about, being a community of practice space, a hub for coordination of activities, and a platform for collaborating to develop solutions. An RDA working group could be formed whenever a specific work product needs to be developed. So for example, mapping of terms to ontologies, or perhaps even an extension of an ontology. If the product itself happens to be an ontology, ideally we would recommend that its development follow the OBO Foundry framework in order for it to be interoperable with other ontologies. Both the interest group and any work, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, an RDA working group could be formed whenever a specific work product needs to be, be developed, right? So the interest group and the working groups will work in concert with relevant community or partner organizations to develop and implement any recommendations and outputs. And there have been several comments in the chat about how this collaborative would interface with additional efforts that are already underway. And this is how we're hoping to be able to interface with other groups that have very similar uh, activities and goals. Those products will then be communicated back to the discipline specific communities with the anticipation of adoption. Next. Another question is how do we sustain that proposed community model? Well, it requires three supporting players. The first of course will be NIEHS and staying engaged by providing both in-kind as well as possible funding support that might um, come in the form of paying organizational membership dues within RDA or using contract or grant mechanisms where appropriate for very specifically defined needs. NIEHS could also support running workshops, codathons, or other events. And finally, it could develop policies and processes that are based on RDA or others' recommendations that are needed to advance the community's goals. In addition, 
We ask that members from RDA and all of you representing the discipline specific communities, both within and outside of the environmental health sciences field are needed to provide that in-kind volunteer effort. And then finally, of course, is working with collaborating partners, those federal agencies, other NIHICs, publishers, as well as many others that will be needed to provide at least in-kind support, if not preferably some funding support. Next. I would now like to open up the floor for discussion. For time purposes, we are focusing on the vision mission, goals, and activities. The organizational structure discussion will be reserved for this, the September workshop. If you have thoughts on that now, that's wonderful. I would just encourage you to please send me an email with those thoughts or to reach out if you would like to talk about them. I'd also like to note here that NIEHS's role is to try to kickstart and foster this effort. Ultimately, you in the EHS community will define and create value for the collaborative. And I think a lot of that was brought to the fore with the comments from uh, on RDA, GA4GH, and how the GO community, how all three of those communities have been successful. So to manage the discussion, uh, we had hoped this actually would have been in person. We had planned for the workshop to have taken place last September before we knew we were going to be in a shutdown situation. Um, but we didn't really want to keep putting off and, and rescheduling this. So we will try our best to manage this uh, with as many people, which is great. We're, we're so pleased to see how many participants we have. So if you would like to participate in the discussion, I have three questions that will sort of be our, our prompts. And raise your hand, you will find it under the reactions icon. If you don't have that option, please just type raise hand in the chat and we will call on you. Uh, you're also welcome to share your thoughts, comments and feedback uh, through the chat box as well. Okay, next. First question here, really writ large with respect to the vision and the mission statements. And that is what questions, comments, or clarifications do you have regarding the proposed vision and mission statements for this EHS language community? Do these seem on track? And I'll see if there's any raised hands or comments coming in. Unfortunately, I can't see. So I did have a question here with respect to the community-driven use cases. And is it possible to use the existing external use cases that you heard uh, from SRP? And most definitely, yes. You know, the the five use cases that Charles had mentioned are really just the beginning, right? We're very much open to what, whatever you as a community feel will be valuable and of interest for, for you. So I definitely, since there is already work underway uh, with respect to those use cases, wholeheartedly endorse having those be uh, some good starting use cases for the community. So I have a comment here from, so couple coming in from Elaine. Elaine, do you want to maybe uh, turn off your mic and uh, yeah, I can uh, uh, talk, um, but I just can't use my screen today at this moment, so I'm so sorry. This has been a fantastic conference, and I'm really, really excited, and hopefully you understand that the questions I've been putting in the chat is because of my enthusiasm and wholehearted endorsement of this project. I do, however, whenever I hear the word community, 
And then mm -hmm. it's just among, um, and I, I'm sorry to say it, scientific geeks as we are around this table, I feel saddened that we haven't really brought, broadened this case because the user community is much broader than we have here. So I really think we need to understand um, understand this. And, you know, my lessons learned have come from things that have been supported by NIHS, whether it's Superfund or whether it's Oceans in Human Health, whether it's working with exposed communities, working with other groups. They want to understand how you think about it. And, you know, the reason that I'm a believer in community-based participatory uh, research is because they are the experts in many of these interactions and many of the impacts. So I'm also wholeheartedly um, endorsing, uh, trying to put that into the community mix that we have here. So thank you so much here. So Elaine, can you expand upon the well, specific types of yeah. communities that you yeah. think we well, should be including? Well, I'll give you a really good example, and it actually, I don't know if Christy Drew is still on the, on the, on, in the audience or not, but when Christy and I worked on the Department of Energy projects at the Hanford site, one of the issues was doing um, work with um, interested groups, in particular in this case, tribal nations, to look at the declassification of data that had been collected. And one of the things I went away from that is that none of the terms, none of the, uh, the um, in that case, we weren't all doing it um, by um, artificial intelligence, but none of the terms that we were using to use um, to make a data dictionary, so to speak, for that information was of utility for the three tribes that were involved in, um, in, those, in, in that uh, area of land. That's one example. But you know, when we go through the children's project and things, we hear repeatedly that the way that we think about exposure and the uh, inclusiveness of exposure terms that we use are not adequate to address their interest areas. I mean, I see um, uh, uh, others around the table that work on the FANEX issues, and I think of the input that you've gotten from the rare disease communities, that those folks, that the way that we look at and put together protocols and, and outcomes just it, it needs to have this other voice there. And what a phenomenal opportunity to do that in this context. So please don't lose that context. It doesn't have to be all dominating, but we at least need to hear this. You know. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you Lynn. can tell my passion on this, Stephanie. <laughs> well, we, we want your passion to be infectious. So <laughs> that's the only thing we want being infectious. So, yeah. okay. John? Yes. Um, my question, I have two, two issues. Uh, one, could adapting an original study to a common harmonized language program affect the studies, uh, affect the reproducibility of the study's results. And also, I second the issue of developing a language for the public, as well as the science community. Okay. Anybody else have their hand raised? Did, Celia, did you have your hand raised at one time? I did, Stephanie, but I'm not sure it's about your actual statement. I thought maybe I, I, it was more about, you know, I can see such a need for this as a person who works in a certain field of science. And, and I can really see how important it is for these harmonized vocabularies at the international level, because all of this, mm -hmm. it's just a lot going on right now with effectiveness evaluation for mercury in the environment. And I just wondering how, to you know to how to form a group how to even engage with this given how much is on everybody's plates you know so that's what i was wondering about because i am really interested i'm just wondering how to find the you know the time to do such a thing i think it's important thanks yes and and that that is a challenge here you know if this is it would have been done if it was first of all easy to do and um people had had the bandwidth to to even do it. So um, I think that that's something that is part of that. We have to just maybe try something. Hopefully we fail fast and early. 
and we reiterate, regroup, and you know, find that right groove and path for being able to make headway and, and succeed. And you know, there's there's a lot of need here. I think we all recognize that. And the challenge is, can we can we start small? Can we scope this? so that perhaps we work through in developing how the model and the organization structure would work and then try to begin scaling it up. You know, that's again, something to perhaps be thinking about when we have the September workshop. So could Katrina, go ahead and unmute. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. First of all, I just want to thank everyone um, as, for, for doing this. I'm a first year graduate student um, and I'm actually here trying to learn because my uh, research project is based on generating novel data. Um, so this is really powerful and incredible. And I thank you all so much for, for all that you've um, shared and all you've directed. Uh, the comment I wanted to just include um, to the point of Elaine and Brandon Gale is, is as this is coming about and as this, this you know, ontology is being formed, it's really important to consider, even though we don't want to reinvent the wheel, to recognize that within that wheel, there, are, there is a lot of uh, inequ inequity and structural racism and a lot of, there are a lot of flaws that have gone unnoticed because they haven't been put under the microscope. And I would just sort of ask that we, as we go forward with this, that we keep that in mind at every turn, because a lot of the structural racism and inequities that we keep seeing proliferating throughout the system continue to do so because, um, you know, they haven't really been challenged. And it is hard work. Um, this is a very big project, but it's very, very important. It's incredibly important, and it really has the ability to change not just what's happening on the ground, but also what's happening in the medical and biomedical fields, because you, we're in a position to actually start people to thinking and asking questions that they maybe didn't have to ask before. So thank you for, for embarking on this. Thank you for raising that, that very important issue, Katrina. So one comment I would like to make with respect to the vision and mission, and I believe that Gail actually made a reference to this, and that is perhaps trying to define harmonized language. It was not lost upon us within the program planning committee as we were writing these vision and mission statements that the term that we used to describe what we were trying to do were rather fraught with a variety of different interpretations. So we had common language, we had standard language, we had harmonized language, we were talking about incorporating the use of the word semantics. Um, and you know, we, we had our own robust discussion around, well, what, what do we call this? And because each and every one of those words can have different meanings and different distinctions, um, to different people. And so I, I'd be curious to just get any immediate thoughts you have about, you know, we decided to call the name of this group, the Environmental Health Language Collaborative, which we thought was generic enough that a lot of things could fall underneath this if that's the scope that people want to move this community into. Um, but do you have thoughts about um, the fact that the vision talks about leveraging language standards and the mission actually talks about a harmonized language, which are technically two different things. Um, a vision is always something that's very future oriented and I idealistic, but perhaps maybe that's too idealistic for us to get to standards. I, I just like to get some specific feedback on about that actual language. You know, Stephanie, this is Gail. I didn't, uh, um, uh, it didn't catch me in the vision for some reason, uh, nor the name of the, uh, of the community. Um, but in, 
and I don't have a solution for for the mission. It just uh, suddenly struck me, maybe because it's at the end of the slide, <laughs> um, <laughs> that um, you know it, it it is a bit of a jargon term. Um, perhaps uh, I don't know how to resolve it, and and I agree that the other examples that the group talked through are probably worse. <laughs> Than, than harmonized because they they have a lot of baggage with them. Um, I'm even, I, I, my first response was, oh, well, how about shared? No, that's not gonna work either. That's even, that's, that's just, that's almost as bad as common. Um, so I don't have a solution to it. Um, I don't know, um, but I think it's something that's worth um, continuing the thought process on in through the fall workshop um, to to try to um, to really hone in more on on something that would be able to communicate outside of a fairly limited community that would understand what a harmonized language is. Sure. Okay. For time purposes, I'd like to go ahead and maybe go on to the next question. So next slide. And um, again, do you agree that these, these shared goals that I'm putting forward here are the ones that we, I guess, theoretically should be starting off with, right? Is there anything that could be added, removed, or refined? And typically goals are meant to be very broad uh, and long-term and then objectives, which is where our use cases and actually defining specific activities would align with these higher order goals. seeing a fair bit going on in this chat here. So Gail's mentioning that it's not just the development, but also refinement or improvement of the current knowledge organization systems that are out there, definitely, yes. And I don't see any hands raised. I know it's very challenging trying to have this discussion, unfortunately, virtually. Um, and Melanie asks a good question, when or how are we going to know we are done? <laughs> and I, I think as what came across in Melanie, your, your presentation also um, with Paul is that you know, this is, it's, it's a living, it's living, right? Um, eventually there will be, there will be some kind of a product. It will be, hopefully it will be adopted. And I'm sure that there will be definitely solutions developed that I'll call them static, right? They, they serve a very specific purpose. There isn't necessarily going to need to continue to evolve them. Uh, but then there might be other situations where we have something that's much uh, more useful to a broader set of the community, maybe akin to to go, right? Where we, if we wanna think on something of that scale and is definitely going to be a, just a continuous improvement type of situation. And I think one of the metrics, and this is something that we need to have the community discussions around is, what are, what are those metrics? How will we know when we're done? What is a signal of success? Is it the number of people who are adopting it? Or do we wanna to try to extend it out to saying, we've been able to you know, have these specific types of discoveries because of the fact that someone utilized um, a, a standard or an ontology or whatever the case may be, you know, they they were able to harmonize these various data sets and be able to, to derive some insight 
from that. You know, maybe that's our ultimate sign of success. But again, you know, those, a, a breakout group for, <laughs> for our September workshop. <laughs> So, so if I may qualify that, so the, I do agree with the, you know, we, we'll probably never really be done. <laughs> uh, but I think that to the point that the other are making is, you, you know, a lot of the language is about, you know, you know, we want to foster community-based development and develop methods and tools, but how do we, how do we measure that success? How do we know we have made that difference? So what, one option is through the use cases and, you know, saying we were able to do this over, I don't know, those amount of projects are engaging. Uh, so, so having some sort of quantification, I think is going to be useful to report on the progress, to, you know, to make sure we're on the right track and there is progress that we can measure. I, I agree. I think that as part of that initial development of, you know, these use case packages, it's putting, putting in as part of that upfront thinking of, well, if we achieve this, what, what is, how do we know that we've been successful in what we're achieving, right? That it's, it's not the development of a mapping, it's not the development of, you know, defining terms, that's a means to a larger end. And I, you know, my, I, I'm very outcomes oriented in that thinking as opposed to an output Right. So if you if you know about those those models, you have outputs and then you have outcomes and the outcomes are always much harder to define. And because mm -hmm. they tend to be so qualitative, usually, as opposed to quantitative. But um, we recognize it, that that's a challenge and that we need to be thinking about that. So we have four minutes remaining and I do wanna keep us on time. Unfortunately, I'm going to skip the next question. I really uh, encourage you to provide feedback directly to me and I'll be talking about that in a little bit, um, a little bit more. So can you please advance the slide, Candon, to, um, to becoming involved? So, um, Hopefully we have conveyed the value of why this is an important initiative uh, for the environmental health sciences field. And my parting words to you are um, basically a call to action for you to become involved and to spread the word. And this community will benefit from all of your diverse perspectives. We need a range of subject matter expertise, of skill sets, of roles and the links to the resources that are showing on the slide will now be sent into the chat so you can quickly grab those. I encourage you to register for the upcoming virtual events. Unfortunately, September is still going to be virtual. Um, we're going to be trying breakout room formats and trying to figure out the best platform so that we can have an engaged discussion. I would love if you could please respond to the community and use case surveys. The links are provided there. Join the collaborative listserv so that you can stay current on what's happening and to begin sharing with each other what you're working on. And as well, check out the resources webpage. We've been getting, we've, we've begun to compile readings and previous workshop information, organizations, ontologies and terminologies relevant to EHS, um, as well as tools that are useful for harmonizing environmental health research. And feel free to send me any feedback you have about additional resources to add. And we want this to be useful. So we know that there's a lot more that we can do in terms of creating this, uh, this resource page and a resource clearinghouse. And then finally, of course, please spread the word. And next, so with that, please definitely feel free to get in touch with me um, if you would like to continue the conversation. And I appreciate all of you for attending and for your enthusiasm.
and looking forward to seeing all of you at our other upcoming events. This is just the beginning of our conversation. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day.